And good morning. It is a Monday edition of Glenn Clark Radio, and we've got a great show prepared for you. April Fools. We've got a normal show. It's uh, not even really a normal show. It's just a show. That's what we got for you. Obviously, um, disappointing way for the weekend to end. The Orioles' bats going silent in their uh, loss to the Angels yesterday. I say silent. They hit the ball hard. They just just wasn't dropping. Such is life. That's the way that it goes. Uh, Final four is now set. Still need two more pieces on the women's side, including the big LSU-Iowa matchup tonight. Very excited about that. Um... NC State did the Lord's work on the Lord's, I guess, day. Is that what we give that? God bless them. Well, it's Sunday, yes. Bless, so yes. bless them. Bless the NC State Wolfpack. I could kiss every single one of them on the mouth. Although I can't win the bracket contest any longer. I, that was bizarre. I don't. They got to work on that like forecast piece of uh, ESPN.com because all it told me was that I needed for Houston to not win the tournament. Like so when that was all well, no, it just, it just said the be- best path to victory was Alabama makes the final four. Houston doesn't win the tournament or something like that. And so when Houston lost, I was like, well, you know, there is a silver lining well, here. It's well, you weren't paying because Duncan has. That's, I, but that's not that's not set. That doesn't matter. NC State doesn't like they only reached the final four. They haven't won the tournament yet. Yeah, but like if they win. Yeah, he's going to win yeah. for sure. But that's irrelevant. The point being. I, my champion is good. But apparently, I still needed Houston to get, the, I guess, the championship game. I don't whatever it was, and the forecast piece of this just didn't do a good job of explaining that. All it told me was I needed Houston to not win the championship. Well, I think so, as infuriated as I was when they lost to Duke, and you know, it, it was just the most Duke s ever that they got a gift to the Elite Eight because the best player in the region got hurt. Um, but as infuriated as I was, there was a part of me that was sitting there like, well, okay, but I was told I needed Houston to not win the championship, and I can confirm, 10-4 good buddy, Houston's not winning the championship now. I got that going for me, which is not nice because it involved Duke playing another basketball game, but at least there's that. At least... I'm going to go ahead and, and check that box off. And so I immediately went back and took a look at the forecast, and that was when they said, nope, sorry, you've been eliminated. Which I said, wait, what? <laughs> you told me that you needed I needed Houston to not win the championship, and I can confirm sources are reporting Houston will not win the championship. That's my understanding anyway. Ridiculous. Just ridiculous. But it's not Duke either, so God bless. That's uh, there is that as well. Um, who are we down to in the? Who still has a chance? Who's still uh, alive? Why am I not logged in? It's weird. ESPN logged me out. Well, that's I'm not concerned about that. Well, I uh, we can't tell you. No, that's 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 not acceptable. Group forecast right now. The favorite to win is Kelly. Sa- Kelly has a fifty percent chance of winning. She has Purdue. Winning it all. Wow, so that means I can't win. Um, there's only four people left that have a chance of winning, oh. including my cousin Duncan, who's the only one that has NC State <laughs> winning it all. So I'm pretty sure. So, so there's four people. Basically, depending on who wins the championship, one of these four people are going to win. Mention Kelly is going to win. Uh, who is this? Who is Wendas Caitlin? What, what is this? ESPN's got a lot they got to clean up here. Uh, Jen Babish could win. Jen Babish uh, is the the top of the UConn list. So if UConn were to win, Jen Babish would be in good shape. And then somebody actually had Alabama, which is wild to me. That someone that's got to be somebody who went to Alabama, right? This Baltimaniac. Who is that? Who is Baltimore? Baltimaniac. Where? Come on. This, by the way, get a clean up. Fine. Clean, clean up your mess, uh, ESPN. John Sears, the late, great John Sears. I don't think he's actually dead, but John used to work for us at the old radio station. John Sears picked Alabama to win it all. Well, what do you know? How about that? So he is still alive in our bracket contest. Um, I, 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 don't, I don't know. Like The funny thing, too, is 
I still think that it's pretty clear that UConn is separated. But now we're down to like the point of it's a basketball game. These other teams are good too. And so anything could happen. I I think I, I I don't know. I'm trying to figure out if like the what the I'll, I'll wander over. I want to know what the the odds are for the four teams that are left. But I can do this. I can handle it myself. UConn a minus minus one ninety. Wow, wow, that's a good bit of separation. UConn minus one ninety. Purdue plus two twenty five. Alabama plus eighteen hundred. NC State plus two thousand. Which suggests that these two games have fairly heavy odds. Yeah, they do. Purdue, nine and a half point favorites against NC State. UConn, 11 and a half point favorites against Alabama. Wow. Wow. I, like, there's a part of me that gets it, but it almost feels like setting those lines based on what we thought those teams were coming into the tournament as much as setting the lines based on what these teams have done to this point. Like, I, NC State just kind of ran through Marquette and Duke. I I think I think the lines are accurate. I will I would I, would, I, I favor UConn and Purdue. Heavily, I feel strongly about UConn. I don't know that I would feel the same way. Honestly, I feel about Purdue lesser about. I mean, I think UConn wins, but I feel like the game might be a little close. Like I think Alabama can score with anyone, and that they could keep these games. Yeah, I, mean, I, I guess I've said I, we, we said that about Illinois too, and yeah, I don't I, I don't know where you'd be getting that off, but what well, you because Alabama can, guys, yeah, Alabama yeah. shoots the ball. Really, I understand really well. that. Yeah. I understand. UConn has not been. Like, UConn has not even flinched. Because Alabama's got Aaron Estrada. That's why. Oh, okay. Uh, UConn has not flinched at this point of the tournament. Griffin, too. So. Oh, right. Well, that does change everything, doesn't it? That does change everything. Um, but I will be taking, yeah, Purdue minus nine and a half. I like, I, I like that. Yeah, I don't I don't know how I feel about that at all. I don't. I, I have think no idea how I feel about that. Purdue's been in tussles. I think Zach Eady's going like, to have his way with DJ Burns. Because he's bigger and better and stronger, and I don't. I, I mean, like b- we could say that about anybody, and <laughs> Purdue has not rolled through everyone. Like I, I, I just don't. W- suddenly, this is going to be the game where I, I maybe, I, maybe I can't. I just have no idea where that level of confidence comes from. I, that that to me is kind of wild, given what we're talking about. Um. Anyway, those are the two lines. Uh, give me give me a second here because what I'll tell you is I pulled those lines from Superbook. You heard me say this last week. Um, we've been encouraging you to sign up with Superbook for some time, and this is the the type of stuff that they don't talk about on other shows. But I'll tell you about it. Um, I hope you took advantage of it. That offer it no longer exists, and for a little while, frankly, I'm I'm probably not going to be telling you to go sign up with Superbook. And it's not because I don't like Superbook. Superbook's been a great partner, great partner, not just with PressBox, but frankly, with me. Um, In addition to their deal with PressBox, I had a deal with Superbook, and I was happy to be on board with them. I bet with Superbook. I got no issue with Superbook. This is sort of the way that the, the world works, and I think we've talked about this since sports betting came in, that a lot of times companies come in, they make a push for a little while, and then they ease off for a little bit too and i think superbook's probably going to be easing off in their push for a little while which is cool man like that's i don't tell companies how to run their business so you might hear us pull lines from superbook because i still like superbook i still have i have no beef with them you might hear us pull lines from other places um as of the moment i i guess i'm a betting free agent i I can shop odds if i want to bet and i can find the best odds and odds that i like the most from somewhere but um, I I I kind of like talking to you guys about these things because it's like y- you hear somebody say something for forever, and then all of a sudden they don't talk about it anymore, and it's like, well, wait, what? Weren't you a Superbook person? Well, yeah, I still I still am cool with Superbook, and I appreciate them a great deal. Um, but they're not going to be advertising with us for at least a little while, and that's t- quite all right. This happens with lots of our partners. This is not. Something we're like, ah, we don't, we hate you. It's not that at all. We're good. Everything's good between me and Superbook. Just not something that I'm going to be uh, talking about as regularly as I was. And you might hear us refer to odds from other places. And I'm the type of person that likes to tell you about what's going on. So that's great. All right, give me that picture of Grayson Rodriguez, please. No. Okay. I'm no, glad I we're prepared. Nothing like preparation. So we're doing, we're Nothing doing every like single game. 
Well, whoever the last man of the match was. Okay. We, we didn't have a man of the match yesterday because the Orioles didn't. Well, yeah, that was the They didn't reasons. do anything. They didn't do anything. But there was a man of the match the on Saturday. And since we decided that we were going to put all of them up on the surrounding area of the sign, then, yes, it does require us to put all of them up um, in order to reflect that. Uh, yeah, bummer yesterday. But on Saturday, of course, season's over. What? Season's because over. they lost a the game? Yeah, I mean, I'm surprised. Don't get me wrong. They're supposed to score 13 runs every game. Well, I would like that. That would be swell if that would be the case. It didn't work out this time. But, you know, such is life. The Orioles did, of course, win the opening series. And now they uh, stick it stick around. Although, what's the weather supposed to be like for the rest of the day? Are we, um, is this supposed I to clear I thought it was going to clear up, but it does not like looking right now. It does not. Are you, are you saying that based on looking outside or based on looking at the weather? Because like, I'm Looking outside. Yes, I'm aware of what it looks like outside. I, too, have a window. I don't feel good that, about the that, way it looks. For God's sakes. So nothing, then. I don't feel good about the way there's it looks. No, there's like, nothing better. Uh, rain <laughs> continuing through 3 p.m. Okay, so then it's fine. I'll pull up the radar here. You just got to pull up the radar. <laughs> that uh, we'll, we'll get Griffin to the bottom of it. Like, How about an hourly forecast? Yeah, it's just said continuing That's through 3 p.m. I mean, like, I'm oh, for God looking at the sakes. radar and... Okay, yeah, it's actually going to clear up. Yeah, uh, about, about by 3.30, it should definitely be. What's wrong with my? What's wrong with what I'm doing right now? Everything. Everything. <laughs> Everything. How? I just you gave you the forecast. <laughs> this is you. 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 You're doing the try too much. Try too hard. When you don't have something, you can just say, "Hey, let me look. I don't know. I'll look it up." And I. You what do did the I just thing. Do? <laughs> it's some combination of your generation and you. Generation. You scrambling because it's been a weird day. It's some combination of the two things where you didn't know the answer. And instead of just saying, I don't know the answer, but I'll get you the answer, you you tried to pad by making up an answer. Well, I don't know how I feel from looking out the window. What the F does that have to do well, with anything? Well, no, my point is it has been I can also look like out the, the last 12 Griffin, hours. I know what it looks like outside. So, like, I, don't I know, didn't ask. I don't know what the field conditions are what does it, it, at Camden Yard. They have a tarp. Yeah, but if it rains so much. Griffin, they have a drainage system. You're, you're not new here. I'm not a professional on you're, You didn't the have the answer, but you wanted to say something instead of just saying, I don't know, which is fine. It's okay to say, I don't know. Let me look it up, which is what I was asking. I don't know if they're going to play today, Glenn. When you see that the rain is scheduled to end at 3 o'clock, then it's very likely that they're going to play. But it's also been a downpour for... It, that has nothing to do with anything. <laughs> There's never been a day where four hours before the game started, the rain ended, and they've said, yes, but it rained a lot yesterday. I mean, like, so what was the we case with opening play. day last year? And that was because people prepare for opening day, because people make a week out of opening day. Well, this is some people's new opening day, right? Like, no. Yeah, tickets were God. more expensive what, this what, weekend. What, what, what has gotten into you? What do you mean? What is like, you're just talking out of your ass. <laughs> like, is there a quota today for you having to say a certain amount of words? You're not adding anything. Just trying to do You're the just show. No, this is not trying to do this show. This is something different entirely. Ask the weather was going to be, and Griffin started talking to me about what the weather was yesterday. Well, yesterday was during the day. Nice. It was nice, and then last night it rained. It has nothing to do with what's going to happen at six thirty tonight. And apparently. The Orioles are going to play the Royals for a first of a three-game series. I don't, I don't know what just happened there. I have no clue how to describe it. Michael Walk and Dean Kramer. It's the pitching matchup for the opener between the Orioles and Royals tonight as the Orioles try to shake things off from yesterday. Technically, yes, Tyler Wells did deliver a quote-unquote quality start. And give Tyler Wells some credit. I, I don't like doing this bit because it, when you say words like quality start, like that's it feels like it should mean something. I think everybody knows Tyler Wells wasn't good enough yesterday. I don't think that we have to 
um, use kid gloves to say that Tyler Wells wasn't good enough. Obviously, we all saw afterwards that Tyler Wells ended up giving them some innings. And there's something to be said for that. I, I, I mean it. There's something to be said for it. You would point out that his whip yesterday was pretty good, too. He only allowed five base runners in six innings of work. He struck out seven. But he was getting crushed early on in the game. You hope that it's simply an adjustment and he got it all out of his system in two innings and then moving forward, Tyler Wells will be something closer to what we saw at the start from a year ago. But I, I just I get uncomfortable when we say things like, well, Tyler Wells pitched a quality start. Right, but like when they needed Tyler Wells... When the game was in doubt, he wasn't good enough. He did a hell of a job of eating innings afterwards. And that, for the totality of the season, will matter too. It probably doesn't matter all that much today. Although, you know, they don't have an off day today. So it is good, I guess, they didn't have to use more of the bullpen. Kind of weird they went to the A bullpen. I guess they've been using a lot of the B bullpen yeah, in the first two games of the season. Kind of weird they went to the A bullpen, and I get it was a three-run game. It wasn't a, you know, a five-run game or something. They were confident they were out of it, but in hindsight, if you don't love that, and, and in fairness, these guys probably aren't taxed. So it's early in the season. It's maybe some of these guys just needed some work, right? Like maybe Yannir Cano just needed the work. Um, I don't know. I don't. I don't want to say too much about it. the Orioles. Lost a game. Tyler Wells wasn't great. Yes, he technically pitched a quality start, and yes, with all three pitchers that have started the season have given quality starts and didn't struck out anybody. at least seven guys. Yes, he didn't walk anybody. That's something. But Tyler Wells' issue a year ago wasn't really the walks. Tyler Wells' issue a year ago obviously was the home runs, and so it, it was a bit unnerving when he gave up another early home run. Now a year ago they were mostly solo home runs. That one was a two-run home run. And then it was followed up by a bad second inning as well. It just it was not a good day, and the bats went silent. It was a good day for Grayson Rodriguez, however, on Saturday. He was man of the match. So we, we go up to the board, and we add him. What kind of tape did we use for the first one? Um, Why did we use the blue tape? I guess because that's what I had. <laughs> that, one, that, one, that tape's not working. Well, it's just going to rip the paper off the sign behind it right. when we well try to pull is, uh, it we're off. We're still early in the season. Yeah, yeah we're, uh, uh, we're, perf- we're, we're working learn on how tape work. Well, now I'm not sure this tape will be much better. I think this tape. Scotch l- tape? Well, uh, uh, oh, it's that? Yeah. that was Let's what try was to find to some scotch tape. <laughs> Let's try to do that if we can. Or, I don't know, push pins or something if that'll yeah, work. Yeah, let's, work. Let's, w- yeah. let's look into that as a company. Try to get behind that and see what happens. We put uh, Corbin Burns. I got to remember what Corbin Burns. I just realized I had this uh, epiphany as I was thinking about this segment. That there will be times where I've got to pull somebody down from the lair to put him back as man of the match. And I didn't know what Corbin Burns' face looked like over the weekend. I was like, what does Corbin Burns look like? He walked in studio right now. Yeah, I would have no idea. I'd just be like, hey, there's some guy here to sell us some water or something. I have no clue. Um, all right, Grayson Rodriguez is man of the match. Uh, we're going to talk to Mike Bordick in just a couple of minutes about the first weekend for the Orioles. Our buddy Eric Arditi will join us this morning as well as Jeremy Kahn, all of that coming up. Why don't we get a break to try to get things settled? It's fair. Got off to a bumpy start today. Why don't we try to settle things, and then we'll talk to Mike Bordick on the other side. Today's show is brought to you by Atman's Deli. Atman's Harbor Point is open and is spectacular Everything you love about Atman's now with a full-service bar. They got the hand-rolled bagels. They got the corned beef piled high, the delicious soups, all available at your neighborhood Atman's Deli. Atman'sDeli.com. I say your neighborhood Atman's Deli. It's the neighbor. It's the Harbor Point neighborhood Atman's Deli. Atman'sDeli.com is the website to find out daily specials at Atman's new location in Harbor Point. Come back in. Chat with Mike Bordick about the weekend that was. It's Glenn Clark Radio. 
The ultimate fan experience awaits you at Sports and Social Maryland. See how we're raising the sports bar with our massive 100-foot media wall featuring 40 HD TVs and a 47-foot big screen. Bet on your favorite teams and this year's biggest events at the FanDuel Sportsbook while enjoying your favorite beers and cocktails, plus our delicious takes on bar food classics. Visit Sports and Social at Live Casino in Hotel Maryland. At Arundel Mills, must be 21. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Hungry? With seven locations throughout Maryland, Glory Days Grill is always right around the corner. They have wings, burgers, salads, sandwiches, and drinks to satisfy everyone, as well as tons of televisions and sound delivered right to your phone. Glory Days is the best place to watch football or whatever your favorite sport is. While you're there, be sure to check out Goose Flights Lager, named in honor of legendary Raven Tony Goose Siragusa. $2 of every can is donated to the Goose Flights Foundation. Glory Days Grill, great food, good sports. What company makes your home more energy efficient, purifies your air, kills all viruses, and qualifies you for $6,000 in rebates? A.J. Michaels Heating and Air Conditioning in Baltimore and Annapolis at ajmichaels.com. Oh, honey, we better stop for gas soon. Let's pull into that Royal Farms. Ugh, gas is so expensive. Nope, it'll be cheaper than you think. Why's that? I signed up for Rofo Pay on the Royal Farms app. Now we save 15 cents per gallon at all Royal Farms. Wow, that'll save us a ton of money. I love you more every day. Well, then don't get a speeding ticket this trip, okay? Sign up for Rofo Rewards and upgrade to Rofo Pay and save 15 cents a gallon on gas for a limited time. Real fresh, real fast, Royal Farms. The Toyota Tacoma comes in a range of models and trim lines, so you can choose the perfect Tacoma to reflect your unique personality and driving habits. Check out buyatoyota.com for deals on new Tacomas from your local Toyota dealer today. Gambling can be a fun and entertaining experience, but there are risks involved. If you're planning on betting on the game at the casino or on your phone or computer, know your limit, stay within it. Set a budget and a time to stop Remember, gambling isn't a financial solution, and it doesn't mix well with alcohol or drugs. Know the risks and have a plan before you begin gambling. For free and confidential services, call 1-800-GAMBLER 24-7 or go to helpmygamblingproblem.org. Jeremy Kahn here. The ultimate sports betting experience in Maryland is at the Green Turtle Bet Park Sportsbook. Join me at either location in Canton or in Towson and place your bets in person and be a part of the action. It's the best in-class sports wagering experience complete with the ultimate TV package, ensuring you can catch every game all day, every day. Their state-of-the-art facilities bring Las Vegas energy right here to Maryland just in time for postseason football. So visit the Green Turtle Bet Park Sportsbook in Canton and Towson and elevate your game day experience and hang out with me to bet, watch, and win at the Turtle. What company has the expertise to make your home healthier by purifying your air and killing all viruses, allergens, and bacteria? A.J. Michaels, heating and air conditioning in Baltimore and Annapolis, ajmichaels.com. Coming back in here with Glenn and the other guy, uh, uh, Garrett, whatever his name is. You know who they are. All right, back in here on GCR as we continue along on a Monday edition of the program. Don't forget, countysports.zone is your place to find all the latest in high school scores, schedules, updates, play pick them, everything you need to know for boys and girls lacrosse, as well as baseball and softball. Countysports.zone proudly sponsored by your local Toyota dealer and by a Toyota.com. Real quick note this morning, and it feels like this is a little surprising. Jamie Kaiser Jr. going into the transfer portal uh, from the University of Maryland basketball team. They got some good news last week with Jacoby Gillespie, Rodney Rice committing, and uh, Julian Reese returning. And I, I would tell you, as disappointing as Jamie Kaiser was this year, and he was very disappointing, um, my understanding was that they were hoping that he and Deshaun Harris-Smith would both be back and would be ready to make a jump. This season, um, not going to be the case, at least not at Maryland, for Jamie Kaiser Jr., well, presumably, as he has entered the transfer portal. All right. Uh, joining us now here on GCR, one of my favorites. He is, of course, an Orioles Hall of Famer. You hear him on 105.7 The Fan. You see him uh, all over town doing incredible stuff for the baseball warehouse, the League of Dreams. He's our buddy, Mr. Mike Bordick, and he's back with us now here on GCR. Bordy, what's going on, brother? How are you? Hey, good morning, Glenn. I'm really good, man. Even though it's a rainy day, pretty exciting uh, weekend of baseball for the Orioles. I think they kind of showed 
you know, that they belong in the top of the American League East and should be considered one of the best teams in baseball. But what, I, I think what you're talking about is is something that, like, struck me for a minute over the course of the weekend, which is, like, they have the right to feel like they're the bullies now. You know, like, that this is – everything that's happened here isn't a fluke. They're not a good story. It's not something – they, are, they have every right to believe that they're the team that everyone else should fear when they show up this, somewhere this season. No, I agree. And I, I think teams feel that already. I, I think last year, uh, word got out pretty quick. The Baltimore Orioles are a legit team and uh, no slouch in the American League East. So, yeah, and they proved that. I, I think Corbin Burns setting the tone that first day with his 11 punch outs and, and Grayson Rodriguez. I thought the pitching – was really good, you know, starters especially. I know Tyler Wells, uh, a rough start, but, man, oh, man, did he settle in and look like the Tyler Wells of the first half of last season. So it's nice to see them have that ability to make the adjustments, uh, three quality starts, three tremendous performances, and three chances to give their teams to win, team a chance to win. And offensively, the first two days, they were lights out. Everybody contributing, great at bat, patient at bat, driving the ball, hitting home runs. And, uh, you know, yesterday a little bit quieter, but still great opportunities to win ball games. Um, I think we were all sitting there waiting for them to come back and win that game yesterday. I mean, just because they did it so many times last year, and they certainly will uh, this season. All right, Mike, you brought up Corbin Burns. I, I have seen very few things like that in my life uh, following the Orioles, right? Like that. You know, you got to go back to Mike Messina, I, and I take nothing away from the other good pitchers that have been here, but it's not just to me how he pitched. It's like I'm looking around the stadium and how in tune with every pitch that Corbin Burns threw that entire crowd was. Like this was not a, hey, the um, you know the, the Angels are coming up, let's run out now to pee or let's run out to, to get a pretzel or something like that. It was we have to see everything that this guy is going to do. And I, I think it adds to sort of the legend of Corbin Burns that has only one start into his Orioles career that, like, I, I, everything about him is completely legit to me as being the ace that this franchise has desperately desired. Oh, absolutely. And I agree. Great comparison with Mike Mussina. Um, You know, he had everybody on the edge of their seat because he always did great things. Uh, one of the... Uh, most fun times I ever had playing baseball was playing behind Mike Messina because he could locate, he could do anything he wanted with all of his pitches. It was just so much fun. And I think Corbin Burns attracts that kind of attention. Listen, his last three years, you know, in, uh, pitching with Milwaukee, he had a sub three earned run average. I mean, he's going to come over to the American League East and just dominate. Yesterday was no fluke, and, and I love how excited everybody was about his performance. Um, and he didn't disappoint. He shows – just incredible composure and confidence. And you could even tell yesterday and the day before how he communicates with his team. Just a great team player and is excited to be a part of this winning organization. Um, Buddy, have you gotten a sense? It, it's so We were talking about this yesterday. To see Grayson then go out and follow it up. I, I don't know. Maybe Grayson Rodriguez, if the Orioles had never traded for Corbin Burns, what we saw last year really was his arrival, his moment, and he was going to have a spectacular, magical season, and he was going to prove to be the ace that we've waited for. But do you get any sense of what either the relationship with Corbin Burns or just seeing a, son a tone setter like Corbin Burns at the top of the rotation might do for Grayson Rodriguez as he tries to make his own jump to perhaps being this organization's next great starting pitcher for a long time should Corbin Burns leave after this season? Yeah, well, I, I think this is going to do nothing but benefit, obviously. You know, Grayson Rodriguez, Bradish, Wells, all, all these pitchers. To witness, you know, one of the best pitchers in all of baseball um, every five days, to be able to talk to him, learn what he's thinking about, how he kind of goes through a lineup. Because he isn't a one-trick pony. He's got a full repertoire of pitches like all these guys do. And Grayson Rodriguez has that floating fastball, devastating changeup, breaking ball as well. His changeup was phenomenal. And I just think how you approach every pitch with purpose. And I think that's what Corbin Burns kind of brings because you can't have that kind of success without it. And he was locked in, and he was locked on his ball game. And I think, you 
know, Rodriguez is going to follow up and be that type of pitcher as well. I think he learned so much after his demotion um, last season. And listen, there are other guys. Kyle Bradish could follow suit. I think Dean Kramer still has more in the tank. I, I don't think he's just an okay fourth or fifth starter. I think he could be better than he is. And I think that's the kind of stuff that Corbin Burns will help bring to this rotation, just extra confidence, extra awareness, extra focus on what their job at hand is night in and night out. Uh, Mike, the, uh, there are a couple of opinions from this first weekend that I've seen from a group of Orioles fans that I wanted to run by you. One is, hey, if Colton Cowser is going to be on the team, shouldn't you be doing a little bit more to try to get him in the lineup? He is like a young player that should be playing. I, I, it's an interesting situation because like the players that you have are so good that you're not inclined that any of them need to rest. Uh, what do you make of specifically Colton Cowser and how much he might need to be in the lineup because there's still probably a development part of the aspect with him where he needs to get adjusted to major league pitching. No, I, I think he'll get his opportunity. Listen, I, I just can't see Hayes, Mullins, and Santander running out there for 162 games. And he's going to get plenty of opportunities to play. I, I think it's important, though, to get your veterans, get their feet underneath them, especially after playing such good baseball, keep their confidence high and roll them out there for that weekend series. I, I was really impressed with, and will continue to be, I think, all season long, as we all will, just the depth of this team. Um, you know, you got Westberg occasionally sitting on the bench. He can come off, play third and second base. Mateo, uh, the same way, Arias. I mean, they are just loaded. There is no weakness, really, on this team. The guys that are coming off the bench could be everyday players on other teams, right? And so... Uh, and I think uh, Colton Cowser certainly fits that mold. He will get his opportunities. You know, God forbid there's an injury to any one of our outfielders, but they definitely need and will be deserving of off days, and Cowser will fit in uh, very well, I believe. Um, the idea of Jorge Mateo playing second base is one that I'm con i got to be honest with you, Bordy, I'm kind of struggling with. I get it. He's got to be in the lineup against lefties. Um I, you know, hit a couple of lapses on opening day defensively. I, there's not a lot of track record with him playing second base, like, at all. And, you know, I, I was just hearing from some people about how important it is for second baseman to be comfortable defensively and have played there a lot. I'm going to move on from that conversation. But, Mike, I, I, I just – I'm confused as to why maybe on a day like yesterday the answer isn't just let Mateo play short have Gunner, I know, ironically, Gunner makes this incredible play. My God, that play yesterday was phenomenal. But maybe oh, Gunner yeah. plays third and Westberg plays second. I just don't know about the idea of trying to force Jorge Mateo as a second baseman. Well, I, I don't know. Part of me agrees with you there. Uh, but I think Mateo is such a great athlete. I, I think if he can show even more versatility and show that he can handle second base, everybody in the world knows that he can be a frontline premier shortstop. Uh, I think just increasing his value that way because if, if, if offensively, if he can't, you know, contribute quite as much as they'd hope, I think he's going to get more of that, obviously, against left-handed pitching because that's where he has success. But if he can just continue to add more value, he becomes a huge trade piece, you know, come uh, mid-season or as the season rolls along. I, I, just, I just love when he's in the lineup. He's so explosive. Um, the opportunity to steal bases, put pressure on teams. And he may have had a couple lapses, but he also made some really nice plays and turned some nice double plays. He seems pretty comfortable over there. Um, and I just think his athleticism can play anywhere on the field. I'm a little bit more reluctant to move Gunner off of short. Okay. I would rather him just stay there. No matter yeah, what. Okay, Gunner, yeah. you, you got it the second half of last season. You know, you proved you can handle third base as well. Gunner, you're, you're going to be the shortstop until you prove otherwise, and you know, or if something gets banged up and you need, you know, to quiet it down over at third base. Um, yeah, I, I would just keep him right there and feel very good about it. Can I ask if it was weird to you that Jackson Holiday was playing shortstop yesterday for the Norfolk Tides? Because it was really weird to me, Mike. Like, I didn't, <laughs> I don't get that part of it. I uh, yeah, I know that's kind of interesting too. Um, but I think uh, you want to keep him happy as well. Oh, yeah. Keep him fresh at shortstop. Because if all of a sudden he sticks at second base, you lose, you lose arm strength. You lose that feel for, for playing the premier position of, 
of shortstop. So I think, okay. you know, they'll try to work that, and they'll give him his opportunities a second, but you still want to keep him fresh at shortstop as well because, you know, if something happens, you know, he may be the guy that comes up and plays shortstop for the Orioles. So you got to keep him fresh there as well. That is a fair point. I will listen to that argument, and that's why you're Mike Bordick and I'm a dummy that sits over <laughs> here and just yells about things into a microphone. Yeah. I, I appreciate that thought process. Was there anything else over the first weekend of the season, Mike, that really jumped out at the, to you? I mean, I, I think everybody was really relieved to see Cedric Mullins uh, get the home run on opening day. I, it, like, it, I feel like Cedric Mullins is the most fascinating part of this team because we know what he's capable of, and, and what he's capable of is being one of the better players in all of baseball. Um, it's just a sure. question of health, consistency, things like that. Anything else that jumped out at you over the course of the first weekend? Well, I was I was really impressed, uh, really with with every part of the Orioles game, aside from a few errors, you know, that I think they'll clean up for sure. But Anthony Santander was tremendous, uh, so much fun to watch him. It took him a while last year to kind of get into a nice rhythm, and, and he jumped out with, with a bang. Uh, Gunner, I thought, was just so impressive how he handled shortstop, how he handles himself at the plate. It just blows me away, uh, being so young. And so patient, boys, just every time he hits the ball, it's like squared up and coming off over 100 miles an hour. So uh, nice to see him lock this earlier and early in the season. Um, you know, I just thought they played some really good baseball and, and, and baseball to be really excited about. Surprised that, uh, you know, the whole bullpen didn't get, you know, quite as much work as I thought. Seeing El Perez going down early yeah. is a little concerning to me. Um but the bullpen was, was okay, you know, in, in my opinion. They, they, they were up and down. And I think that's where there's going to have to, you know, thank goodness the pitchers got deeper in the ball games, right? Six, six innings each, and, and hopefully they even get stretched out anymore because I just really believe that bullpen's got to be protected this season. I know there are going to be a couple guys that emerge as, as just, you know, locks out there in the pen. But right now it, it's like, uh, in my opinion, the biggest question mark on the team. Mike Bordick, as always, what can we uh, what can we talk up for you? What do you got going on? Well, I'm actually heading in to give some lessons at the baseball warehouse right now, but I, I want to throw one thing in about the baseball warehouse. Um, we started up a Mike Bordick scholarship fund to give kids opportunities to come to clinics and, and lessons for free. I think that is the ultimate goal of Matt Morris and the baseball warehouse, to let kids have the opportunity to be a part of baseball and not pay any money. It, it's just amazing how much money has, has unfortunately influenced this game in, in a negative way for young players. So our goal is to continue to try to raise money and give kids these free opportunities. And uh, so being able to, you know, generate some funds through fundraising or don't, you know, gracious donations will certainly help the baseball warehouse give kids more opportunities. And it's in my name, so it makes me That's feel awesome. really proud and honored to be a part of that that's really of course, cool the league of dreams oh yeah always doing tremendous things mike that's so cool man i i it's a, I, I i'm happy for you and that it means that much to you that's a really really neat thing and, and your legacy is obviously already significant here but it simply adds to it Bordy, love you brother let's talk soon all right thanks for doing this all right you got it glenn i appreciate it man mike bordick with us here on gcr appreciate him taking the time for us Hey, a little bit later on this morning, we're going to debut a new Monday feature. Um, it's going to be very similar. The concept is not all that difficult, and I feel like you all can figure it out. Three up and three down. It's sort of like pats and slaps, right? Uh, we'll do it every Monday for the previous week of Orioles baseball, not for the totality, not for like, hey, so far this season, this guy's doing it, but just trying to look and separate that week of Orioles baseball the way that we do a, a week of football games. It's just that a week of football games is one football game. Um, so we'll try to do it on Mondays. If the Orioles have a series from the weekend that maybe extends to uh, through Monday, then maybe we'll push it back to do it on Tuesday. But um, we'll look forward to that, and uh, we'll do the first one a little bit later on today. Three up, three down, and it's ranking too. I, did, I, I didn't I think, I'll, think I made that clear. I want you to rank them as well because we do want to do a point system much like uh, we try to do, do to keep up on it as the season goes on. Um, so ranking three to one, three up and three down for the week of Orioles baseball. We'll get to that a little bit later on this morning.
Today's show also brought to you by the Stan the Fan Variety Hour, which returns a little bit later on today. Stan, Ross, and Luke will get together to talk baseball with you at 3.30 today. 3.30, live at Facebook.com slash PressBox Sports. You can also watch it a little bit later on at YouTube.com slash PressBox Online or PressBoxOnline.com slash video. They'll react to the first weekend of the season Preview the Royals series and more. Stan, Ross, and Luke today at 3.30. We come back in. We'll continue some Orioles conversation with our buddy Eric Arditi from Barstool and Exit 52. That's next. It's Glenn Clark Radio. Hey, it's Jeremy Kahn. This postseason, bet in person at the Green Turtle Bet Park Sportsbooks with locations in Canton and in Towson and enjoy the best in-class sports wagering experience at their state-of-the-art facilities, bringing an unmatched sports betting thrill. Gambling can be a fun and entertaining experience, but there are risks involved. If you're planning on betting on the game at the casino or on your phone or computer, know your limit, stay within it. Set a budget and a time to stop. Remember, gambling isn't a financial solution and it doesn't mix well with alcohol or drugs. Know the risks and have a plan before you begin gambling. For free and confidential services, call 1-800-GAMBLER 24-7 or go to helpmygamblingproblem.org. Discover one of Baltimore's hidden gems at Guilford Hall Brewery. Enjoy dinner in our spacious brew pub. Sip a signature cocktail in our outdoor dog-friendly beer garden. Or take a tour of our brewery. Discover your new favorite local craft beer. From crisp lagers to hoppy ales, there's something for everyone to enjoy. Pair your brew with delicious appetizers and entrees. There are options for the whole family, but you have to try our fan favorite giant pretzel. Guilford Hall Brewery, where every sip is a celebration. Visit us online at guilfordhall.com. Make the most out of every day in your Toyota RAV4. Available in hybrid or gas-only models. A RAV4 can get you where you want to go in style. Check out buyatoyota.com for deals on new RAV4s from your local Toyota dealer today. Oh, honey, we better stop for gas soon. Let's pull into that Royal Farms. Ugh, gas is so expensive. Nope, it'll be cheaper than you think. Why's that? I signed up for Rofo Pay on the Royal Farms app. Now we save 15 cents per gallon at all Royal Farms. Wow, that'll save us a ton of money i love you more every day well then don't get a speeding ticket this trip okay sign up for rofo rewards and upgrade to rofo pay and save 15 cents a gallon on gas for a limited time real fresh real fast royal farms craving that classic new york deli experience look no further than the new atman's deli in baltimore's harbor point corned beef piled high hand rolled bagels and something different a bar atman's has food and drink specials every day now open for breakfast lunch and dinner dine in grab takeout or hang out at the bar for the next o's game atman's deli an authentic taste of baltimore tradition since 1915 find us at harbor point or visit atmansdeli.com what company has the expertise to make your home healthier by purifying your air and killing all viruses, allergens, and bacteria. A.J. Michaels, heating and air conditioning in Baltimore and Annapolis, ajmichaels.com. Hungry? With seven locations throughout Maryland, Glory Days Grill is always right around the corner. They have wings, burgers, salads, sandwiches, and drinks to satisfy everyone, as well as tons of televisions and sound delivered right to your phone. Glory Days is the best place to watch football or whatever your favorite sport is. While you're there, be sure to check out Goose Flights Lager, named in honor of legendary Raven Tony Goose Siragusa. $2 of every can is donated to the Goose Flights Foundation. Glory Days Grill, great food, good sports. One of the things that's definitely wrong with this country is that this dude still has a job somehow, some way. Glenn Clark. Back in here on GCR as we continue along on a Monday edition of the program. Today's show is also brought to you by Ruth's Chris. I can just hear the plate sizzling. Smell it. Smell it. Bring it to me. Bring it to me. Of course, you know, we love Ruth Chris. What's not to love? And whether you're looking to just have a nice night out or entertain clients or celebrate some sort of milestone, the place to do it is Ruth's Chris. Count on them to deliver to you the finest steaks, the best service, and level hospitality that has made Ruth's Chris one of the most revered names in steaks since 1965. Make your reservation now at ruthschris.com. I do want your thoughts on three up and three down. Maybe a little bit more difficult 
the, like a lot of the three up the spots are claimed on that list. Um, but I do want yours at Glenn Clark Radio on Twitter for three up and three down this week. We will share them during the course of the day before we share ours, and we will get used to doing that on a uh, daily or on a weekly basis here on GCR. In the meantime, bumped into this guy on opening day. He was delirious. Like, I don't know that he was drunk or he was just drunk on what he was feeling on that particular day. You, of course, know him from Barstool and the Exit 52 podcast. He's our friend, Mr. Eric Arditi, and he's back with us here on GCR. What's going on, brother? How are you? I, I think I was stone cold sober. I was just very yeah. excited to see Griffin as I was. Is that what it was? The you bar. So, dude, like you were in a place, man. It was like the power of Corbin Burns was transcending through you. Like you were, I, I don't even know how to describe it. Like the, the words were barely coming out. Like I thought you might be, I, I couldn't tell whether you were like in tears or erect or a combination of both. Well, it's funny because, again, we were sitting like a second away from each other. I was in 92. Yeah. Um, and so I'm sure you could probably hear me muttering. You didn't know it was me, but I was saying over and over, I can't believe Corbin Burns is an Oriole. Yeah. Like, I can't believe this is yeah. real. This is real. So that's probably where the, the like, delirious part comes in. But, yeah, that's – that's I, I don't know. He took he took my breath away. He took my words away. I, I had – that was just my reaction. I, I don't know. I could not believe what I was watching. I've been struggling to fully quantify it, Eric, because, look, we've seen solid we, – we've seen really good six innings worth of pitching from Orioles pitchers mm-hmm. in our lives. But what we haven't seen post-Mike Messina is the guy with this much surrounding him de- delivering not just in that way, in that performance – but in that theater, right? Like, it adds so much more to it that it was on opening day and in a year where there's genuine belief that this team could, like, win the World Series. And to set the tone like that and have an entire stadium hanging on every pitch, bro, I've seen a lot of things in baseball, but in this city, I have not seen that, I don't think, in my life, frankly. I mean, I remember I was at the Jason Hamill Easter game, so oh, I, you know, I God, know what it's there like was to that. be there. Yeah, for, that's a good point for big for big that. time pitching performances. Jesus. But no, you're you're right because again, I think there were a lot of people who were kind of like, yeah, you know, Corbin Burns and we got him and all that, but like, what what if he gives up five earned runs in right. three and a third and right. you know walks four and and then it's you know. Oh, by the way, Joey Ortiz has a two-run home run, and DL Hall strikes out nine. And well, I, like, well, dude, dude I would again. I would add to that, like even if he just pitched like well, even if he look Tyler Wells technically gave you a quality start yesterday, right? Like mm-hmm. if if yep. that was what you got from Corbin Burns, it would be called a quality start. But everybody would walk out saying, "I thought we were getting Corbin Burns." Like I thought, yeah, I thought we were getting the dude. <laughs> like that's what I thought we were getting. The, like the stakes were high, even for one. For one start in a 162 game season to set the tone like that. Yeah, no, no, and 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 you nailed it. And and again, he came out, the expectations, the the ceremony, the pictures, the the moment of silence, you know, the new ownership and all that. Like he had every, it had every reason to be like, you know, I it, he just he performed in in every way. He executed everything, and and it was better than I think any of us could have ever imagined. And I think, who was it? Was it Derek in Utah street who was like, thank God for Mike Trout because him hitting that home run, because, you know, we could have been in the sixth inning going, Oh, right. Yeah. He's got a perfect, he's got a perfect game going right now. And Brendan Hyde has to take him out. So again, that's, that's, that's the kind of start we had where on the first day we're like, man, what, what if he did, what if he did have a perfect game and he didn't hang that one, you know, breaking pitch to, to Trout or something like that. But it was awesome. I, I And like you said, we've seen performances like that. We've seen Daniel Cabrera do it. We've seen Eric Bedard do it. We've seen Kevin Gosman do it, Dylan Bundy. But then the next start was an inning and a third with, you know, eight home runs versus the Royals or whatever Bundy did that one day. Um, but, yeah, like this is, this is the norm with him. That's what I just kept saying to myself. This is the norm with him. Like this is what it's going to be like. So let, let me cover a couple things. And I want to talk to you because you referenced the, the new ownership group. And I, I want to talk about it because I wrote about it the day at Press Box. But I, we, I, I use the word, hey, there's an expectation this team could win a World Series. And there is, right? But I, I wonder for mm-hmm. you, 
how far you're willing to let yourself go there, right? Like, we, we all acknowledge it. It's a possibility. But do you allow it to move into, like, expectation? Ter- like, that's really what you think this team is? Or are you saying, let you know, it's April. Let's revisit that as we get closer, and I decide what my belief is then. No, I mean, I, I truly, again, and call me a homer, do whatever you want. I think this team can win it all. I, again, I think... I think barring – and obviously, you know, baseball, these aren't going to be the same 26 guys we see in October. But, you know, if they add a bullpen guy or two, maybe another starter, I mean, why not? We've already seen – and, again, tiny, tiny sample size against the Angels. I get it. But we've seen what their offense can do. I mean, you know, you blinked on Saturday, and they put up nine runs without without getting an out. Like, I, I definitely think this team can can win it all. Um, and, again, I mean, we, we, we've seen the overhyped teams – kind of lose it in the past, like the Dodgers and every Like, I was, I'm watching the game with my dad last night, and he just goes, I don't know how anybody beats the Dodgers. I said, we've said that for years, though, you know? And so I, I don't know. I, I, am, I am in the camp that, that they can win. Again, I think Corbin Burns and Grayson are a legitimate one-two. And then, again, if you're throwing Tyler Wells in, in, in a playoff game and, and he's your number three or something like that, I think it could be a lot worse. I, I really like him. And, and, again, I think he rebounded nice yesterday after the – tough first uh first two innings but yeah I, I think i think this team could easily win a world series not not I, easily but yeah i think they could definitely be there I, i'm in this weird place where like i i still think i think it's a possibility i feel like i need to i, I need, still need to see a few things right like i still need to see like what the back end of this bullpen looks like when you get into a stretch where you need to call upon it um mm-hmm. I, I i think i need to see consistently i there's still some things i need to say in order to believe that they i don't know I believe they can. To feel an amount of confidence about it, I feel like I'm going to need to watch the season unfold to have some sort of amount of confidence about that. Yeah, that, ma- that makes sense. Again, I, 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 I drink the orange Kool-Aid a little more than, than most, so I, I'll, I'll allow that. But, yeah, I'm, ri- I'm right there with you again. It's, it's, as we go along, you know, I think we're, gonna, we're obviously going to see who this team is and what they're made of and what they need to add. But, again, like if you told me if, if we had the click remote and we fast-forwarded eight months and we were like, man, that Orioles World Series run was awesome. I wouldn't be like, wait, what? Right. They, you know, they did it. It would be like, right. yeah, oh, okay, I can, I can see how where this came from. Eric Arditi, Barstool RDT, of course, the Exit Fifty Two podcast. He's with us here on GCR. Uh, dude, uh, how exciting was it to see Jackson Holiday playing shortstop in Norfolk yesterday? That was, that was really. Was that was that your tweet? Who <laughs> after he made that play, you just were like, wait, what? Yeah. Like he's playing where? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, um, yeah. I like I, I don't want to be the one to have to do this, but like I, I'm in this weird place where I don't think it's the end of the world. I disagree with it. I don't think Jackson Holiday should be in Norfolk. I think it's 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 borderline crazy considering he could come up and win Rookie of the Year, and you just cost yourself a top 35 draft pick in the process. Like I, that part I'm I'm really hung up on. But it's not the end of the world to me. It's just that like we kind of have to hold you accountable for what you're saying. And and I I like Mike Elias and I think he's done a lot of good things, but the number of times he's just said things that are truly puzzling to me, and and the bit where, yep, we're gonna send him down there. We want to see him play second base six days out of seven, and on day three, on day three he's playing shortstop. <laughs> like, dude, what what is this? And to suggest that like second base defense is so crazy important. And then in two of the first three games of the season, Jorge Mateo, who has never been a second baseman ever, is playing second base at the major league level. I, I can't I, – I'm just incapable of letting those types of things slide or just accepting it because, like, dude, whatever the reasoning is, if there's good reasoning, say it. If not, we kind of have to call you out for it. I agree 100. percent And again, I, I'm I'm a very big Elias guy and supporter, and and you know believe in that he knows what he's doing and building this thing because look where we are now. Right. But I'm with you. It's it's like, dude, it's it's you can't you can't say like, yeah, we we want him to work on a second base defense and then move him to short, you know, after a cup of coffee. Like that's just not how this works. And 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 again, I swear to God, if we see a lefty on the mound and he's sitting that day, right. it's, you know, starter, a lefty starter, and he's sitting, people are going to be like. Mike, what are you doing? You know, you, you said the reason he wasn't up was to face lefties and work on second base. And now he's sitting, you know, he's sitting down with slides on in the dugout right. like this is not a good look. So, yeah, I'm, I'm with you. And, and I, I, I also fell in the same category as like I, 
obviously, I, like I tweeted, and I was very unhappy that he didn't make the opening day roster, right. and that was selfishly that was selfish of me because I wanted to see him run down that orange carpet and get the ovation and all that. I understand why. I fully get it. Like I had people, everyone and their mother, being like, "Well, actually, here's why he's doing." Um, no, I get it. I know. I, I'm I'm a stupid person who wants to watch the best player, you know, the best players well, play on my but, team. But I so do think it goes beyond that. Like, yeah, that's part of it, sure, right? Of course that's a, a factor in it. But, dude, I'm telling you, for me, it's that there's a reason why every other team is putting their guys on their opening day roster now. Like, mm-hmm, there's a reason mm-hmm. Jackson Merrill's on the Padres and Colt Keith in Detroit and Wyatt Langford in Texas – in fairness, I brought up Jackson Churio in the past. I forgot that he already got a contract, so it's a little bit different for Jackson Churio. But still, he, mm-hmm. he even though he's got a contract, he would still qualify um, for the PPI program. Like, I, I just can't imagine putting yourself in this predicament where, like, what if, what if you do attempt to manipulate service time and then you bring him up in late May – and in August, you wake up, and he's like the runaway favorite for Rookie of the Year. What, do you, what are you going to do? You then yeah. – all, all you did was just cost yourself two months of him having the opportunity to be at the major league level. I, I just it, – it, it feels like that should be dead. And so I want to believe the other side. I want to believe that, hey, this is genuinely about development and genuinely about that, but it sort of spits in the face – when the guy that you have playing second base in the major leagues is not a, a second baseman. Like, he's – there is nothing at all. And I think he was a little bit better yesterday, but Jorge Mateo on opening day was kind of brutal at second base, which makes sense because he's not a second baseman. Like, what? <laughs> yeah. what is this? And, again, I would have understand if they, if they had prime Brian Roberts there. And it's like, ah, listen, you know, we right. – we have a guy and, and Jackson, you know, we don't feel comfortable with him. So that's perfectly fine. That's perfectly fine. But, yeah, if you're like, hey, he needs to work on his defense, so we're going to throw out, you know, Jorge Mateo out there. And it's like, oh. Right. Uh, well, okay. Right. Um, like, he's athletic. I get it, but I don't really agree. Right. Like, I, I don't – I can't. I can't. I, it, it bugs the hell out of me. What about uh, our buddy Paul Valley is all up in arms, the fact that Colton Kowser hasn't played yet? What do you make about that? I don't. I, I'm not too upset or worried about it. Um, again, I know he came in and what he had a double. He had right. a double, I think. Was it a double? Uh, on his, his one at bat the other day. I think that's correct. Yes. Um, yeah. And again, I mean, I don't. I'm not reading too much into anything. Again, it's it's the third game. Like like I had someone tell me yesterday, like I'm worried about the Orioles, uh, their power outside of Henderson and and Santander. And somebody goes, buddy, they scored nine runs in the sixth inning yesterday <laughs> without getting it out. I think their power is okay. You know, like probably be all right. I, I don't. I, I'm just. If if we're having this conversation again in a month, then I get it. But three games in, I'm not too worried about cows are not getting you know the start. And and again, I mean, when it comes down to it, he's he's a fourth outfielder, and that's kind of what their role is. You know, he'll come in in some blowouts, and he'll start like you know they're they're facing Walker tonight. I could see him starting tonight, and hopefully that that kind of. Fills everyone's uh, Kowser quota. I I want a big Kowser quota. I, I want him on it, the field. It's it's weird, ever. right? Like, I because I know exactly what Paul's feeling. I don't have the correct answer for this mm-hmm. question. Is the correct answer Same. that Colton Kowser shouldn't be on the major league roster? And th- this is this is the problem inherently. The three guys that are playing are three guys you want playing. If they're going to be mm-hmm. on the team, there's I, there's nothing that we say no today that definitively proves that Colton Kowser would be more helpful today is a Major League Baseball player than Austin Hayes is. Like, we just don't – there's nothing that we would know that would lead us to saying that. Now, maybe we'll, we'll feel that way in a month or so. I don't know. But today we don't know that. So it, it is a unique situation where I understand the thought process, hey, if he's here, you want him to play. And I get that. But at the same time, who's not going to play in order for that to happen? Exactly, and again, are you going to take out the starting outfielder for the for the AL last year? Are you going to take out the guy who was thirty thirty less than you know right. four years ago, or are you going to take out you know one of the best um, switch hitting power bats in, in baseball right now in Santander? I I think I I originally thought the move would be you put Kowser in right against lefties or against righties, and then Santander with DH, and then again you can kind of mess around with it from there, and 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 you know do whatever you need to, yeah. but. I don't know. Again, I'm I'm sure as the the year goes along, the the water will find its level, and and he'll get a, you know a decent amount of of starts and and at bats, and it's not going to be an issue going forward. And hopefully, again, when they're win- you know 
they're nine and one. No one's going to be complaining about no, you know, no, not remotely, and, and, and all that. It, it does so. speak to the other fascinating subplot to the entirety of this season. Like they're they're trying to win while at the same time there's also an old guard, new guard thing happening with this franchise, mm-hmm. right? Like, and and nobody nobody knows what the answers are because nobody really wants to trade away any of the veterans because they're the pieces that have gotten you here, but. We're also pretty convinced those guys aren't going to be a part of this thing in two years. So you're like walking this fine line between trying to win with those guys while also suggesting that maybe the guys behind them might be better. It's it's a really weird thing that like, my God, compared to everything we've been through is being Orioles fans. Holy F, I can't believe that this is where we are. But at the same time, it is fascinating. It's fascinating to see how this plays out over the course of the next, you know, 24 months. Absolutely. And again, it's it's not, we're not being like, Oh, how do we get D you know, DJ Stewart into this lineup? <laughs> right. We need that back. Right. You know, it's, right. I, I get it. It's Colton Cowser. So I get it. But again, you know, and, and we've talked about it before, but man, is it a great problem to have, you know, where it's like, we don't have room for the number five pick in the draft a couple of years ago and one of the top prospects in baseball. Like, and you can have that conversation with like five different guys now. Like we don't have room for Heston. We don't have room for this guy. We don't have room for Jackson. So again, it's a great problem to have and, and we're very excited about it. But again, maybe that does get cleared up by a trade. Maybe it's Ramon and Hayes to the guardians for Bieber, or, you know, something like that. And, yep. and that does open the door there. But I, I, I don't know. Again, I, I'm, I'm perfectly okay with, cows are not getting I, I'm just not I, I can't get wrapped up in that like I expel too much energy and other stuff that I'm all fired up about so that one is not one of the things that I can get fired up and and all uh, ruffling my feathers about Eric I got a column up today at press box and it references it's been a, a good first week for the new ownership group right like they they hit all mm-hmm. the right notes and they're David Rubenstein's telling old Frank Robinson stories with um, Ryan Ripken <laughs> and um you know, talking about how much he loves uh, his uh, being from City College and trying to connect with people from Baltimore, and um, the you know the rest of the owners are out there at Pickles buying beers. Like everybody's doing all the they're saying and doing all the right things. We're in five years, we obviously are not going to judge this ownership group by how many beers they bought us. Although that doesn't mean they shouldn't buy more. Maybe, like, Maybe. like all for more of it. The one thing, is, and I, I really appreciated how openly they've used the term World Series, right? Like, I, I like that they are setting the standard by which we can measure them. Like, we're, we're not saying we want to win a World Series. They're saying it. So it's totally fair for us, you know, in the next couple of years to say, hey, you know, you, you, you were talking about winning a World Series. What are you doing to get in there? The one thing that, that I don't want to say irked me, but I couldn't help but notice is – David Rubenstein, in all of these interviews that he did, and I tried to watch or read as many of them as I could, and and I unless there's one that I'm missing somewhere, I I haven't seen any amount of commitment about spending money yet. And in fact, like he's kind of dodged it a little bit, like when he's been asked. I know the banner like asked about it with the, you know, extending uh, any of the group of Holiday Henderson or Rutschman, and he was like, well, I'm. I need to have a lengthier conversation with Mike Elias before I commit to anything. And I get that. I'm not, you know, that, that in some practical way that works. But I would just kind of like to hear them say, hey, when it makes sense, we're going to spend. When, when it's the thing to do and when, when Mike Elias says that's what he wants, we're going to do that. I would just sort of like to hear this group say those words because I feel like we're still dealing with an awful lot of – you know, I, 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 I'm trying to think of the term. If it's like Stockholm Syndrome here in Baltimore when it comes mm-hmm. to that concept. I'm still waiting for, for this group to sort of say, hey, by the way, we do intend to spend money where we can, where it makes sense. That doesn't mean that you have to, like, guarantee that – because I don't know if, if Rutschman, Henderson, or, or – you know, we, they're all different circumstances. Two Boris guys and someone who's only a year away from arbitration, right? Like, it might, it might be that you can't do it. I don't know. But I would just like to hear them say out loud where it makes sense. We're gonna spend money. Yeah, absolutely. Again, I, I think that would get really get the fans behind them. I don't know if any fans really are behind the ownership group right, right now. Um, but yeah, again, I mean that's that's kind of what we're all waiting on. It's you know we we for the last what year and a half we've been told like well you know they can't spend money because of the lawsuit and then the lawsuit's over and it's like well they can't spend money because of this or they can't do it because of that or well, you know, the lease and the sale and blah, blah, blah. Like we've heard every reason why they can't 
sign extensions right now or, you know, why the checkbook is closed. And now it's like, what's, you know, there, there is no reason right now. At least we're not being told a reason. So, yeah, I think everyone is kind of waiting for that. And like you said, it's going to be tough with, with the, uh, the, the, the Boris guys, Jackson and uh, Jackson and Gunner. I, I think Adley would be a perfect, you know, a perfect candidate for an extension right now. Um, get kind of get that out of the way and, and go from there. And again, that, that would really get the fans fired up. And I think really fully believing in, you know, the ownership group and the future and all that, but yeah, I, I'm, I'm with you. I've, I tried to watch and listen to everything I could uh, with him. And I, yeah, that, that was kind of the one thing that you didn't hear him talking about. And he's been great. Again, there's yep. nothing on a hundred percent. There, there are no real, here's what we're going to do, or here's what I want to do. Here's my idea. So Again, it'll be interesting. I guess maybe you know after the first, the initial week, and after everything last week, it's kind of like, hey, let's give me give me a week to kind of like catch my breath, and then you know, then you know maybe he and Eli sit down and say, all right, where do we start? Who do you want to talk about? What do we do? So, um, it would be as as electric as last week was, and last week was electric. If somehow they were to get one of them done, it would be one of the more electric moments in the modern history of this franchise. Like, it would just, there is very little that you can do as an owner that would change the course of this fan base or, or then, then somehow getting one of these deals done. It would be, uh, there wouldn't be enough beer in this city. They couldn't buy this city enough beer <laughs> if that were to be the case. All right, what's going yeah, on? No, what, what's I, going I on with you? What, uh, what all can I plug for you, my friend? Uh, just we're exit 52, all that good stuff. You know, I'm being annoying on Twitter by shooting off a million tweets during the games. Uh, and never, everything kind of feels right in the world again. You know? that's, that's, that's really about it. Life is good these days at EDD 22. <laughs> that's how you follow him. Love you, buddy. Appreciate you. Uh, let's, uh, let's figure out a hang sometime soon. All right. We will do that. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate you, bud. Eric Arditi with us from uh, Barstool on exit 52. Always appreciate him. Yeah. That's what my column is about at, um, at pressboxonline.com. And, and it's acknowledging both things. And and I, I know if the, if the owners of the Baltimore Orioles did nothing, if the new ownership group just showed up, had no press conference, they didn't really have a press conference, they just had a, they just made some comments. David Rubenstein made some comments. Um, had no public introduction, didn't go buy anybody a beer, didn't walk around the stadium shaking hands with anyone, did no interviews, did not if they did nothing, for most Orioles fans, it would still be a net positive. Nothing. Because the barometer is set pretty low. The relationship between Orioles fans and ownership ain't great. So do nothing. Already a thumbs up. Instead, in the first week, they really did. They were prepared well. They went out of their way. David Rubenstein really did everything he could to try to connect. It's very difficult for a billionaire to connect with the average person. The average person has next to nothing in common with billionaires. But in Baltimore, in particular, it's, you know, I think we had a little bit more distrust of billionaires. So I appreciate the effort that he went to try to remind everybody about his humble beginnings and, you know, every, everything. About, I, I appreciate that. I appreciate using the words World Series. I appreciate all of it. I love that Mike Arrigetti and, and his buddies went over and bought everybody a beer. There's no move. I know the new owner of the Commanders did the same thing on the day he was approved, where they like called into um, 1067, the radio station, and said, hey, everybody there at your like party, we're buying all of them their next round. I always functionally wonder how that works. Like if the bar that's like, oh, great, now we just gave away a ton of beer, where's our money? Like I've always wondered how that actually like plays out. But, um, you know, like then like... <laughs> Is there a system in place for the bar to understand who already got their free beer and who didn't? Like, I'm not sure what to do with that <laughs> exactly. But it's an easy thing to do. It's going to make everybody happy. But we're not going to measure that by that. Like, these things are good things. And I do think it's important for I say I, I'm, I'm happy that they're doing these things. 
but there was just one thing I wanted to hear last week, and, and I'd not heard it yet. It could change at any moment. It could be that later today, David Rubenstein... By the way, I, I thought we were to understand it was Stein. And then last week, it was Steen again. And, like, during the announcements at the stadium, it was Steen. So I feel like that's what we have to go with is right. Rubenstein. I'm glad this is one of the you know one of the issues that yes, is uh, plaguing true. this, this organization right now. That's a good <laughs> point. We got to get to the bottom of that because I definitely could have sworn that we were told it was Ruben Stein, S- but they, yeah. the way they were announcing it last week was Ruben Steen. I don't know what to do with that. That's very confusing. Anyway, moral of the story being, I let's call him Ruben. Rube. Well, I, Ru, Ru, uh, well Rita was Rita's Rita was going with Uncle Rube so we'll or just Uncle Rube. I guess I'm not I'm not opposed to it, but I I think if I Uncle even Rube. addressing him, I feel like you should have his name right. It's very weird. Um, I just want to hear. I don't need you to tell me that you have an economic plan. I don't need that. But you've got to be aware of how much this particular issue exists for Orioles fans. When you take over this role. Somebody's got to make me aware, hey, the one thing, sure, winning in general, but like, like beyond that, willingness to spend when appropriate. Nobody's asking for this group to come in and on day one be the Dodgers. I mean, it'd be cool, I guess, but nobody thinks that's realistic. Or even to be Steve Cohen. And I think that they're going to be willing to spend money. It's my gut. But I just want to hear it from them. I just want to hear David Rubenstein say, hey, when appropriate, and when Mike Elias thinks it's the best thing to do, it's another thing that I've appreciated is the the deference to Mike Elias. I said the get-go, I like new ownership. What I don't want you to do is come in. uh, Billionaires have a history of blowing things up that work because they want to do it their way. I appreciate the deference being shown to Mike Elias in this initial phase from David Rubenstein. That's a good thing. But at the same time, I I just want to hear the next part of it. When it makes sense, we will be willing to spend money. The issue here, I I can't tell you who it's going to be on. I can't tell you that we're going to be able to lock up all of the young players that you like. But when it makes sense, we're going to be willing to spend money. That's it. That's that's the one thing that I'm kind of looking to hear or see. Just, Just say that. And again, actions do speak louder than words. If next week they announce an extension for any of these guys, even if it's for Corbin Burns. It's going to go a long way, and it'll answer all the questions. But I would just like to hear that sentence from this group and an acknowledgement of, hey, we know what the issues have been in recent years. Payroll's been slashed, and you have felt like there have been opportunities to take on more money in order to better this ball club and improve the chances of winning the World Series. We're telling you if that's what we need to do and that's what makes sense for us to do, we're going to do it. That's it. That's the only thing I'm asking for that I still haven't heard yet from the Rubenstein group. And if I'm missing something, if there's somewhere where it exists, because I went through and, you know, the athletic piece and the banner piece and the sun piece, I went through all of them. And I just couldn't find that. So if I'm missing it, tell me. I did find in the banner where he said, I, I'm, I don't want to say anything about that until I've had a conversation with Mike Elias. And I, I get it. That sounds smart. But you don't have one. It's kind of hard for me to believe that knowing how long this process was in place, that you haven't had that conversation with Mike Elias. It would almost seem bizarre to have not had a long sit down conversation. I would have other questions if that were the case. But then, two, I don't think it requires you don't have to know who the player is. To be able to say, guys, understand. When it makes sense, we're going to do it. We're not here to keep the payroll low in the name of profit. We're here to win, and if that requires spending money or it it makes sense for us to spend money, that's what we're going to do in order to take that next step. That was the one thing, the one thing that I kind of like to hear. 
All right, today's show brought to you by Sports and Social. And thanks, everybody, who came out last Thursday night to hang with us at Sports and Social for the round of 16. The national semifinals are set, and we're going to be back there on Saturday night. We want you to come hang out with us inside Live Casino and Hotel Maryland at Sports and Social Saturday for the national semifinals. We're going to have great giveaways for you throughout the, the night. There's incredible food and drink specials. For Saturday night, there's going to be a live DJ. There's going to be cheerleaders. The atmosphere will be unlike anywhere else you could go to watch these schools battle it out for a spot in the championship game. Obviously, uh, UConn and Alabama, Purdue and North Carolina State. Come watch the games with us. Win some money. Hang out with us Saturday at Sports and Social inside Live Casino and Hotel. And spoiler alert, we're going to do it again on Monday for the title game. So all throughout the weekend, come hang with us at Sports and Social inside Live Casino and Hotel. It's going to be a great weekend for the final weekend of the basketball tournament. But before that, some more baseball to be played here in Baltimore. Coming up tonight, the Orioles. So the rain is expected to clear out in time. They'll get things underway against the Kansas City Royals. Joining us now here on GCR, a former Baltimore Oriole who is a part of the broadcast crew for the Royals. It's always a pleasure for us to welcome back to town Mr. Rex Hudler, who's with us now here on GCR. Rex, it's Glenn in Baltimore. It's great to chat with you, man. Thank you for taking the time for us this morning. Hey, Glenn in Baltimore. I am so thrilled. And let me just tell you, the experience I had with the Orioles was way better for me than it was for the birds. <laughs> let me just tell you, I got to I got to learn the Cal Ripken way. I got to, you know, b- rub elbows with Junior and Billy. Of course, I played with them in Rochester, yeah. Billy, a little bit. But uh, just, uh, you know, and my only claim to fame is being drafted ahead of Cal Ripken Jr. So, look, yeah, if there's any uh, Oriole history there, uh, then so be it. Yeah, you know what, Rex? We I appreciate your honesty about all of that. And I love that it still means something. I think the times that we've talked, I've gotten that sense that, like, you still get some fun bo- vibes whenever you come back to town. Oh, I do, especially when I first when I started broadcasting back in 99 with the Angels. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they, they, uh, the Orioles put me on their board on on the, the scoreboard there, and they said former Oriole or, or something like that. And I and I was standing there, and nobody applauded, nobody clapped, nobody did anything. <laughs> and and so Brad, I, I remember the designated hitter Brad Fulmer was on the on deck circle, and he looked up there, and then after the game he, he goes, "Hud, dude, nobody even clapped for you. I mean, did you ever play here? I mean, so it was." It was hysterical. I love it. But you know what? Earl Weaver traded for me. I didn't want to come there, but I did. But I, I ended up loving it. Uh, Rex, I feel like it's probably not quite as much as excitement as there is in Baltimore right now, where there's a genuine belief that this team could be on the way to winning a World Series. But I think the Royals are one of the teams that a lot of people around baseball looked at coming into this year and said, boy, they made some really like savvy pitching moves. We know there's clearly young talent led by Bobby Witt Jr. There feels to be a bit of a buzz surrounding this team as perhaps the team that could be like the Orioles two years ago and maybe take the step towards announcing themselves as being ready to compete in the coming years. Glenn, you've done your homework once again, buddy. You're right on. It was exciting. Three games we played there at Coffin Stadium here uh, against the Minnesota Twins. Now, they – they shut our offense down the first two games. Right. But, you know, yesterday they, uh, the Royals had enough of it, and they unloaded, and they shut them out and beat them bad. And, you know, that will just tell you, the offense is led by Salvi. He's, he's their world champion, their team captain. He's not going anywhere. He's a 25, 35, 40, depending. I mean, he's hit 40 before, homer guy. Uh, and then, you know, you got Vinny Pasquantino back. Um, junior's leading that whole parade, uh, hitting early in the count up there. Michael Garcia is a, an interesting player, very level swing, puts the ball in play, has some drive. Already, he's already got two homers. He only had four all the last year. This kid could emerge, and they got Isbell in center field and, and uh, uh, Hunter Renfro, you guys remember that yep. name. Yep. He's out in right. So there's some – MJ Melendez, a good power-hitting left-handed young guy. There's some talent out there offensively. Now, where they made their, their, their games was pitching, and you know – Anybody that knows baseball, I mean, that, that's the currency is starting pitching. You've got to have it. 
So we didn't have, we we trusted all these young pitchers the last couple of years. The Royals drafted them. They tried to develop them at the big league level, and it just didn't happen. You you can't uh, win with young pitchers out there. They they can't throw strikes. So J.J. Piccolo, who took over for Dayton Moore, um, said, "Hey guys, let's go to work. Let's uh, let's go out and find some veteran players." So Will Smith, uh, three-time world champion for three different teams in the past three years, by the way, never been done in the game in the history of the game. They signed up the uh, Will, who started his career back in 2012 with the Kansas City Royals. And so then what? Ha- Will, Will Smith uh, started talking with J.J. Piccolo, and he's asking J.J. What can I do to help help us uh, get some more guys? So he helped him recruit some of these players. Chris Stratton, who was a pitcher, you know, bullpen arm for uh, in Atlanta. Uh, John Schreiber, they traded for uh, a, a five six year veteran uh, from the Red Sox, and you know they've also they, they also picked up uh, uh, except Luco and Michael Walker. Yep. You guys will see Walker tonight. He's going to start. Um, so you know now the veteran. We've had three quality starts in a row to start the season i mean so we're excited here you know you got starting pitching you got something and especially in the central where anybody could walk away with that uh it's a long grind we all know that but but so far uh there's a lot of energy in that clubhouse uh rex you bring up obviously waka and lugo the guys that went out and got i feel like the two that are maybe the most fascinating for the royals ability to take that next step we're, we're not going to see um you know brady singer but we will see Cole Reagans on Wednesday. How important is that duo of Singer and Reagans to what the Royals with this core, with Bobby Witt and Pasquantino and all that, are capable of being in the coming years? It's the perfect mix. Now, they've counted on Brady Singer for the last four years. He's done it with two pitches, sinker slider. And, you know, with good movement, and you can't – you you cannot – pitch and be a starter in the big leagues with two pitches now you'll be a successful bullpen arm no question but you, you're going to face the lineup three times through you've got to have more than two so a little bit stubborn early in his career uh, i don't have a good feel for my change up well now he does he they split his fingers kind of a split pitch split finger change up um action coming out diving away to lefties and into righties and then he developed a four seam fastball how about that yep. you know there's the fastball is the toughest pitch, to, uh, the best pitch in baseball because there's so many variations from it. Four-seamer up in the zone looks good to the hitter. The closer to the eyes, the ball looks bigger, but you can't, you can't square them up. Most of the time, you just foul them straight back. And when you got a nasty slider, and he threw it yesterday 60-something percent of the time, and he punched out 10 uh, uh, um, Twinkies yesterday. It was beautiful to see. So Singer now has no pressure. Last year he was the the, the lead singer. This year he's he's kind of you know taking a back seat to Lugo, who looked really good in his opener. And I'm sure Waka won't be easy uh, for the Birds tonight either. But uh, he, he it's taking some pressure off of him. They look for him to become a lead singer on this team, no doubt about it. And then you mentioned uh, the other kid, uh, who is it? Reg- uh, Cole Reagans, yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness. I can't wait to watch Cole, and I'm sure the Orioles will not want to see him again. This is a big lefty that throws 97 to 98 miles an hour with a nasty changeup, hard slider, big curve. He got the whole the whole package, and we got him for Araldis Chapman last year. The first trade that was made before the deadline uh, last season was the Rangers. They knew they needed an arm. They knew we had Chapman. They eyed him, and we held out for their best pitching prospect, and they gave us Cole Reagan last year dominated was the pitcher of the month for the month of august and and so this year gosh he only went out there and punched out nine set a team record for opening day start uh they got to him a couple of times he gave up one homer but he won't be easy but these two guys here that you mentioned these young guys to go along with some of these veterans arms um is going to be good now the other the other the fifth starter is alec marsh who came on last year a uh, really strong, hard, hard mid nineties fastball, tough slider, and a really good competitor. So the Royals will definitely be different with this look, and they already have three quality starts. Like I said, and there's a lot of teams out there already early this season. They can't say that. The um, you know, the the contract for Bobby Witt Jr. Uh, Rex, we're jealous, right? Because we got this young core here in Baltimore, and we are desperate to see at least one of them be locked up long-term and to point the flag down and say, 
whether it's Adley Rutschman, Gunnar Henderson, or, or Jackson Holiday to come, count on this guy being here for a long time. What did that do for the club? What did it do for the fan base to see, yeah, we're serious. Like, we know what we have. We have a generational transcendent talent, and if it requires an awful lot of money, and this is not, you know, this might look like a great contract down the road, but on day one, it's not a home. This is not like what the Braves were doing with their young guys where they were getting discounts. This is real money that we're talking about with Bobby Witt. How much did it do for everyone to see the Royals step up and make that type of commitment? Oh, man, that, that's huge. You know, especially for Bobby Wood Jr. to commit his entire career here. That's the big thing. Yeah. This young man wouldn't have, if he didn't, if he didn't think that they had a chance to win, he would have never uh, uh, committed his whole career here. He was, you know, he's going to be a free agent in just a few years. And this guy, he was a double away from the cycle, and he had two shots at it yesterday. Uh, this guy is amazing. Um, gosh. I, I, I got to play five years in the American League, five years in the National League in the 80s and 90s. Um, and I can tell you, gosh, maybe Barry Bonds, um, you know, Tim Raines, nah, because he's a shortstop. Bobby Wood Jr. could play any position on the field if they let him, but he's, he's vastly improved from his rookie year. The metrics are off the charts. He had a plus 14 and ounce above average last year. When the, in his rookie year, he had a hard time slowing the game down. The game was a little too fast for him. And at 21 years old, oh, my gosh, heck, I wasn't even in the big leagues yet. This kid um, has extreme skills. And what's fun is I don't think I've seen a faster player. And I played, you know, my day with some pretty pretty good runners, Vince yeah. Coleman and, and, you know, Willie McGee and guys like that. But, man, uh, he, he just has uh, – he has six tools. And that sixth tool is his baseball IQ. Coming from a baseball family where his dad pitched over 10 years in the big leagues, he, and, and, and he's from Texas, and might I tell you that uh, my parents are from Texas, and when you're a kid raised with, from Texans, you, they, they pride themselves in manners and respect and being a quality human being, and that's exactly what we got. We got a, a real true gentleman. He's a team first guy, want to win only, don't want to talk about me. So he has everything that you would want. And, yes, the Royals wanting to build a new stadium. The vote is tomorrow, as a matter of fact, oh, wow. uh, uh, on the initiative. Um, and so then not only did they re-up Junior for over 200 it, it possibly could be $300 million contract or even more if all the uh, incentives are reached, but he invested over $100 million in those veteran players, the pitchers and, and Renfro and other guys. So now the Royals fan base is all thrilled. They've never had an offseason like that. And so coming into you know, the momentum has never been greater in Kansas City. And what do we want to do? We want to enhance the downtown area just like Camden Yards did for Baltimore, just like San Diego's stadium downtown, just like the, the Detroit Tigers, and how it's illuminated their city in, the, in downtown Detroit. Um, you know, just a lot, of, a lot of positives are rolling because of Bobby Witt Jr., and I called him last year, Bobby baseball because that's who he is. I had to call my buddy Donnie Mattingly. That's the last uh, Donnie baseball Donnie we've baseball, had. Yeah. Uh, so I, I called him up and said, hey, Donnie, because we were teammates. Donnie, do you mind if I start calling this kid Bobby baseball? And he goes, no, uh, that guy is amazing. So, yeah, you can t possibly build a team around that, but you got Garcia at third. Nothing gets to that left side. So when you got Lugo and you got these, these guys, Brady Singer, that, that are sinker ballers that pitch to contact, what do you need behind them? A solid defense. Pitching and defense win games. Therefore, you know, you throw a little offense out there. The, the, the great years in 14 and 15 the Royals had when, when they went to back-to-back -back World Series, pitching and defense. They only averaged four runs per game because they had a pin to win. So they're developing the pin. The pin got roughed up a little bit in the first two games uh, to open. But, man, it's exciting. It's all there, especially with new management now uh, on the field for their second year. It's a whole different year this year, um, and let's hope we never see a 106 loss season again. Uh, all right, before I let you go, Rex, uh, one, a couple of former Orioles on the roster, but one in particular, Adam Frazier, who was here last season. And, look, he was not you know, the best offensive player here, but I, I still think that the, the young guys on this team really got a lot. One, on the pitching side, 
from having such a solid defensive second baseman behind them. And two, I think a lot of the young players has really learned a lot about, you know, the, the way this works from the time around Adam Frazier. I, I, can I assume that was the thought process for the Royals in bringing Adam Frazier as well as, look, a, a guy who's done a lot of things, who can help these young pitchers by providing defense behind him. We know he's probably not going to be the most lethal offensive weapon, but he, he's going to do a lot in trying to help this team take a step forward and learn how to win. That's right, Glenn. You, you got it right. Um, you, um our guy, our guy Frazier, he's a put the ball in play hitter. He's not gonna. He, he might he might run into one or two and, and hit hit a few homers, but he's in that lineup to move runners to be a situational type hitting, which the Royals manager Matt, Matt Quattrero, uh, second year manager, he, he, he really worked on it with his team in spring training, moving runners, because you know when you play in a big yard like like uh, Kauffman Stadium, you know you're gonna hit you'll have some homers, and there's some guys that can cut through that and hit homers, but you know what happens when you face great pitching, like in postseason, when they are, when they pitch under power bats and they overswing. How are you going to score runs and win games? You've got to be able to move a runner from second base with less than two outs. You've got to be able to hit a sack fly, get up underneath one, and and find a way to 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 beat your opponent without the home run ball. So this is what Frazier is going to be good at, and he already has. He can't, he got a couple of big ribbies the other day um, by just getting in there and grinding. And when you have a young nucleus of an offensive uh, unit and defense out there, he added some glue to it. And so that's exactly what we're expecting out of him. And so far, so good. Uh, Rex Hudler, first of all, I want you to know that um, uh, Chris just reached out and said, let's not sell Rex short. He actually scored a run as a pinch runner in a game against Seattle. Uh, for the Baltimore <laughs> Orioles on May 25th of 1986. So That's right. No, I've got to run, and, hey, don't forget that stolen base I got for Earl. <laughs> Rex. Uh, uh, he needed that bag. Now, he was a three-run homer guy. Yeah, right. He, yeah, he traded for me when they got out on Wiggins, and they weren't sure about Wiggins. And so I was kind of like a little support uh, system behind him. But obviously with Billy coming, it just didn't work. But like I said, I have no regrets, and I, I am a better human being. A better have better baseball knowledge from from watching Cal Senior. He's the only guy I ever seen throw batting practice with a smag. He had a lucky strike in his in his left hand, <laughs> and then, and, and he's and he's the only guy I ever saw shower with a smag. Uh, and so th this guy this guy was a Marine sergeant. I loved him. I respected him. The baseball knowledge oozed out of his pores. This guy, he was a classic, and so I'll I'll never forget that. And I love the, the junior and Billy. I could go on and on, man. man. What a great experience! I have so many questions about Cal Senior smoking in the shower, but that that'll have to be for a, a conversation for another day. Rex Hudler, really appreciate <laughs> taking the time for us this morning, man. Enjoy your time back here in Baltimore. Thanks for doing this. Believe it, Glenn. Thank you for having me. Thanks, brother. Rex Hudler with us here on GCR. Oh, I have so many questions. So many questions to follow up with. I've been obsessed with the story of the uh, conjoined twins. I can't stop. I can't stop thinking about it. If you didn't see last week, it was a story that that shook the internet to its core. These conjoined twin sisters who literally share everything from the waist down. One of them got married. I called Jeremy because I want to talk to him about this. I want to continue this conversation with him. I've been obsessed with it. It's all I've been able to think about, and that might now be. The good news, thank you, Rex Hudler, is I might finally be able to re replace that thought with thinking about Cal Senior. Well, no, hang on a second. Maybe I shouldn't. Maybe I shouldn't. Uh, huh. All right, then. <laughs> Strike it from the record. Back to the conjoined twins. <laughs> Back to that. Uh, today's show brought to you by Goose Flights, which is available all over town. Uh, Goose Flights is delicious. And more importantly, it goes to benefit a really worthy cause because 198 from every can sold goes to the Goose Flights Foundation and the work that they're doing to provide non-emergency medical transport for those in need in continuing the legacy of the great Tony Saragusa. Pressboxonline.com slash gooseflights in order to find out more. Jeremy Kahn is with us now here on GCR. Uh, Jeremy, I just learned from Rex Hudler that when uh, Cal Sr. was with the Orioles, he would smoke a cigarette not only as he was running drills on the field, but also in the shower. 
I, I there are a lot of like how grizzled. I don't know if you remember there was a segment that Norm Macdonald and Garth Brooks did one on once on SNL that was like it was a game show who's most grizzled. I feel like the the idea of Cal Senior smoking in the shower has to go to the top of the list of like the most grizzled things I've ever heard of from, about anyone ever. Yeah, I would think of like Cal Senior and and probably Jim Leland as probably oh, two guys that have yeah. had uh, burn marks on their palm from cupping cigarettes to hide them as they're just <laughs> hitting heaters in the uh, in the alleyway there, just like getting down in the clubhouse and you know popping them now. But um, but yeah, it doesn't surprise me. Like hearing the stories, though, I do love the the shower one though. Like just having yeah. a, a heater right there in the shower. Right in the shower. You're going. So have have you ever been like? Were you ever a shower beer guy? Not really. Okay. I, to me, when I knew I was at a place where, like, I, I, I uh, my buddy Chad, who I used to do a show with, would always say Thanksgiving was the day, right? Like, when you wake up on Thanksgiving and you realize, like, the world is your oyster for that one day, go ahead and mm-hmm. have a beer in the shower. I, for me, it was always at the beach. Like, when I was at the beach as a younger man with no kids, I love the idea of a shower beer. I don't know how to explain it. It was just like, this is the way to set the tone for the day is to drink a beer in the shower, and I truly miss it, and I stand by it as one of the great joys in life. See, I, I've uh, say what you want about me, um, but I've become a, a glass of wine in the bathtub guy. Ooh, so, look at so, you! Very, you think I? Fancy. You think I don't know that? <laughs> you, oh, you, pinkies you, up! You forget that <laughs> That's I was the in the thing. bathtub with you. The other yeah. Day. <laughs> Man. Yeah, I've definitely become uh, take my edibles, get in the bathtub, and listen to the same song for thirty minutes straight, or <laughs> yeah, right. you know, anything like that. Oh God, you and me and the Beyonce record—that's the way it's going to be yeah. in the bathtub later today. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I, how much have you thought about? Are, I, I'm sure because you're a man who knows everything that's going on on the internet. I'm sure you are familiar of the story of the conjoined twins where the girl got married, right? It's, I um I talked about this in the world of stupid today because okay. I, right. I know a little bit more than I probably should, I, but I'm so intrigued by this. Jeremy, story. I have not been able to. We did a segment about it yesterday. I have not been able to stop thinking about it. Every time it disappears from my mind for like five minutes, I'm telling you, ten minutes later, it crawls back in, and I find myself <laughs> saying, "How?" all over again. I cannot yeah. think. I, I I can't get it out of my brain how any of this works. So I don't know how much you know, but they, they do share one womb. Right. Um, they each have their own heart, right, and own lungs, I believe? Yeah. The, everything waist down, they share. Is shared. Correct. Yeah. And that's what makes it interesting. There, were, there was an old meme that was pretty funny. It said, do you think you have it rough? These are coin, uh, conjoined twins, and only one of them's gay. Um, and, you know, like, so like, you think about things like that, and you're going, <laughs> oh, wait a minute. How do you make these decisions then? Like, and, and again, like, I'm not even trying to be mean. I, you know, I know people are going to make jokes. Hell, I've made jokes about it. But, like, realistically, that's a – I mean, do you just have to buy into what the other one wants? I, or? That's the, and so the questions that I've not been able to get answers to, do they both feel everything, right? Like, if – and, and I, I know that somebody's going to say you're being ins- – I, I, this is a genuine question. I'm not judging or making a joke. Like, if if they stub their toe – do they both feel it? See, in, in like the, the Corsico brothers with Cheech and Chong, where one would get hit and the other one would feel it. Um, sorry, that's an old movie. I, I, I do. I, I do. I yeah, never yeah, forgot yeah, it. Yeah. <laughs> but no, but no, hang on, because what you're talking about, this is what we, because like part of this is like, if he's only married to one of them, but having sex with both of them, but what if like the other girl can't feel it? Like she's just like, yeah, I don't, whatever. It's, it's so I, I have a really awful question, and I asked it this morning, and it, I know it's bad, but understanding what I'm saying, what happens if one of them dies and the other one doesn't? So I feel like this has come up before in conversation about I, – I, I don't have the answer to that question. I feel like – Do you do Weekend and Bernie's it for the rest ju- of your life? I, or maybe. Just- maybe. I don't, I don't know. I don't know, and this is why I can't stop thinking about this topic, Jeremy. I want to know it's the so answer to, to like, all of these things. I was talking things. to somebody else. You know the new movie that Will Ferrell is going to do with his his longtime friend, right, who's transitioning? No, I don't know anything about this. So, yeah, Will Ferrell's doing like a documentary with one of his best friends that's transitioning. And they're going around the country and they're like it's just – so it's a documentary on him. And I'm like so intrigued by that too because like I don't, I don't understand it. You know, I don't know it. And like um, that part of it, like I'm not, I'm not 
bashing anyone, you, you know, live your life, whatever. Um, but you know, the, the, the thing is like, I'm so intrigued by that process and how that whole thing works. Not that I want to do it, but it's almost like, you know, when I would look at, I, I look at different, I look at things differently than most people, which is probably obvious, but, right. um, but like, no, I, I'm honestly intrigued by the lifestyle no, that's, what, and what it's what, done to what you you're and how your life There's a difference between gawking and being interested, right? Like just yeah, wanting to yeah. know. And that's sort of the way that my brain is working here. I, I have no interest in gawking. I just want to know. I find it fascinating. I want to be educated about this topic. And because of it, I can't stop thinking about it. I cannot. See, but I, I also want to make as many funny jokes as I can, too. Well, but yeah, like that's, that's the way, yeah. Yeah. So that's where like the gray area is for me. Because, well, why start? Like, why I, would you start that now? <laughs> I support anyone in their whatever your life choice is and you want to do. But like they didn't choose to be conjoined twins. No. But now they have to choose things together, which is just so weird. It's so fat. And like the way they're going out of their way to say, no, he's only married to her. He's not married to both of us. I'm like, there's a part of it. It's like, well, do they have to say that? Because like otherwise it would be considered, you know, like incest. Like, is that like they have to. Like what or, or, or like polygamy is illegal in states, so they have to say he's only married to one of them, but like dude, there's there's gotta be no chance he's actually only married to you know what I mean? Like I can't I can't yeah. shake this. Yeah, and like is that their arm or her arm? Right. I is brother brother, you and I, I'm glad that we're simpatico about this because I figured Yeah, and, it, we, and again it's there's nothing negative. I just No curious. That's it. No. And my friends call me whiskers. <laughs> Oh wait, what's that all about? I'm curious, <laughs> I'm curious like the cat. Yo, oh, that's that's why that's the case. I thought yeah. it could be anything. All right, um, where are you at with these two? So we were talking about it earlier. The two games that we're getting on Saturday both have huge lines. I, I I get. I think UConn has separated themselves. I think they're the best team now. Who knows what's actually going to happen? That's the reason why nobody goes perfect in betting because we we can't guarantee this. I am yeah. a little bit confused on the other side. I feel like there's almost a reluctance to acknowledge because I think Purdue's good. I really do. But I think we've seen them be fallible at more than we've seen. you. Like, UConn has barely been stressed during this. It's not quite the case for Purdue. And I still feel like there's, like, almost a reluctance to acknowledge what NC State might be because we're still thinking about what they should have been had that cat from Virginia made a free throw a couple weeks ago and none of this ever happens. <laughs> Yeah, how weird is that? Um, and, and, you know, it, it is strange, too, to just sit here and look back at this run. I, I, I mean, I talked on uh, the show yesterday, and, and I think I talked a little bit about it with you guys, but, uh, um, you know, like, they've been my kryptonite the whole time because I don't know what to do with them. Every ounce of my body and how I've done gambling tells me to bet against them, but then you get this hot team. And anybody in analytics will tell you that, like, hot teams, it's not a thing, you know, lefty mash. They are, yeah, they are what they are, yeah. right. Yeah, it, there, there's a lot of people that buy into that because they can't quantify why this team's doing what they're doing, and NC State falls that way. Like, if Purdue had played NC State on a neutral court in the middle of the season, I mean, they might be 15-point favorites. Yep. Um, and then here we are as, as they're seven-point favorites, and everything is just so strange looking at it. Um, or what is it? What is it now? Is it nine? It got up to nine and a half, I think. Nine and a half. Okay, and I think that's right. I think that's the right line movement. I'm going to be all over Purdue. I, I just – I've said it all along that my, my heart and my head are telling me two different things. Like I do want to buy into the hot team, but I, I think this is the end of the road because they finally have, I mean, Zach Eadie's just a different animal. So um, especially at the collegiate level and the way Braden Smith's been playing, I think those two difference makers are why they win. Let's, um, let's NC State doesn't cover the three well and, and Purdue's one of the best three point shooting teams. So if they have an off night, you know, we'll see. Let's assume it's what, you know, everybody thinks it's going to be and it's UConn and Purdue. I really am of the belief that UConn is that much better than everybody else, but what do you think that line is on Monday? I think UConn's probably like five and a half, six. Okay. Um, okay. And, and I wouldn't be surprised if it was a little bit higher, depending on how that game looks. Like, I hope Purdue just absolutely annihilates NC State, and that way I can bet the hell out of UConn in the championship because – uh, Klingon's the best, like one of the best defensive centers in the league. So he can, or in the league, in, in, in all of college basketball. And he can offset uh, Zach Eady. And then watching Tristan Newton and Braden Smith go at it's going to be a thing of beauty. Um, but, you know, Tristan Newton's a, just a better player. And, and when you start looking at all the other pieces, I didn't even mention Caravan, who I think is just the glue piece for that team. 
Um, there's just so much talent on UConn, and they do such a great job. They can beat you in a slow-paced game. They can beat you in a fast-paced game. And I think they just absolutely handle Alabama on uh, Saturday. Um, I, 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 look, I just I – there's so much better. There's so much better. And it's funny, too, because – I don't even know that it's like they have the most brilliant offense of all time. I just – they do so everything well. Like, there's just no – and they seem – the the other thing that jumps out, and a couple people brought this up about their coaching staff, they seem prepared for everything, for everything. that they face, yeah. right? Yeah. And and the other part of that, too, like the thing that really got me uh, this weekend and just looking at them is they go on a 30-0 run against Illinois. Illinois had dropped over 70 points in every single game. They were just – destroying teams and they ran into UConn and UConn said, what do you guys think you're doing? And then they held them scoreless for seven minutes to start the second half. It's, it's just like, it's still who nuts. does that? Who, who does that against a team that's as hot as Illinois? So I don't care who UConn faces. Um, like I do, like I bought into some of the Purdue losing, like the whole Virginia thing. You lose that, that game against the 16. Now you come back and you make this run. Um, I'm buying into that some, and Zach Eady's special, so like he could go off against anybody. But I just think UConn's far and away. I thought they were better than everyone, and I had questions about Houston. I wanted to see them play Houston, and we're not obviously getting that. Nope, not getting that at all. All right, Jeremy Kahn is with us here on GCR. Um, Jeremy, I, I we we talked a little bit about the Orioles yesterday when you were sitting in with us. I, I am I'm in a weird place where I think the Orioles can win a World Series, but I'm not ready to like go all in just yet because there's still questions that I have to I am still just so in love with the feeling and like everything about the vibe of Thursday and Corbin Burns delivering what he did in that spot and that entire stadium reacting to like every pitch that he threw in a way that I have so rarely seen in my life as an Orioles fan from a pitcher right a relationship with a pitcher and a crowd I've never it it was like watching a rock concert to me seeing that I'm just so effing in love with the vibes of what Corbin Burns has brought to this baseball team. Uh, the thing of beauty on, um, on Thursday, I mean, you give up the home run to Trout, and the only thing you can complain about is that you gave up a home run to arguably one of the best players in the game right. on opening day. No big deal. And then he settles down and just strikes out <laughs> so many guys. And then Grayson follows it up, and you're like, hell yeah. But So we're going to the game Wednesday as a show, and that's Corbin Burns, uh, Corbin Burns versus Cole Raggins. And, Raggins is another young up-and-comer to watch, a big uh, strike thrower, and uh, gets a lot of Ks, so I'm interested to see some of the young bats face him on Wednesday. But, yeah, man, it's it's appointment-setting time for Corbin, and I got news for you. I was telling the guys this morning, like, I'm a bit of a contrarian when I look at things, and I love all of our young players, and I'm probably getting jerseys for all of them, but the first one I'm getting is Grayson. I just think this guy doesn't get as much love as the others. And he's going to be so important to what we're doing in our future, and, and I think we got our own. Well, it's interesting. Or better, right? Yeah. It's interesting that you say that because it really the thought that I had going through my mind is, I, as much as there will be disappointment, I, I have accepted totally. Corbin Burns is here for one year. That's it. And I know that there are people that want to be like, well, you never know. And I, like I hear you, but it's just I my I'm in my mind accepting that Corbin Burns is here. And it might be that the greatest value of Corbin Burns here for one year is to prepare Grayson Rodriguez to be the long-term Mike Messina type, the long-term Jim Palmer type. That, like, for this year, he transitions from getting his feet wet, getting established, and obviously the great second half that he had a year ago, that by seeing the tone setter and the guy that he gets to throw behind, by the time we get to the end of this year, perhaps we're comfortable with the idea that that's who Grayson Rodriguez is for the next five to six years with the Baltimore Orioles. Yeah. And, you know, that could possibly be it, too. Like, I, I think we'd all love to see him uh, stay here, but you don't know what it's going to cost. Right. And I think, honestly, at his age and the money, like, there haven't been many starting pitcher contracts that have worked out outside of maybe Max Scherzer. Ma- I think. Yeah, Max Scherzer's oh. worked out famously well, but yes, you're right. It's... You know, like, and, and I'm not saying that's a reason not to do it. Like, I was just thinking about – um I was listening to a baseball podcast talking. It was Daily Fantasy for today's slate. And you hear all these names of guys that are on different teams, and you're going, damn, man, I, that guy was supposed to be a stud. And now, like, what is he? You know, like, it, and it's strange. Like, Reese Hoskins on the Brewers now, and I don't even know how to feel about that. But uh, but there's other players that were, like, touted as these great players that just aren't panning. Like, I heard Javier Baez's name mentioned for the Tigers, and I'm going, God, he's an afterthought, and when he played for the Cubs, we thought he was right. one of the Superstar. most phenomenal guys yeah. to watch play the game. Absolutely, it's just yeah, the game can pass you by real quick, man, and it's it's a shame, but um, especially with guys with high strikeout rates, and, then, and that's why I think when you look at 
you know, what the Orioles have been building. They've been building these just absolute mashers, complete players, and um, all over the diamond, too, not just on the infield. I mean, the outfield's loaded with them. There is, like, you know, it's it's funny because our, our buddy uh, Paul Valley was, like, getting into it with Orioles fans because he wants to see Court, uh, you know, Colton Cowser out there. And I'm like, I, I get it, man. I do. And it's a weird spot to be in because you want him to play because there's still, like, a development factor with Colton Cowser. But at the at the expense of who? Like, that's the yeah. problem that you have at the moment is – I get the idea of where you're trying to find a way to have four starting outfielders if possible, but like it, it is a tough thing when you look at those lineups. I, I've got a completely different – the Jackson Holiday conversation is a different conversation because there is a position that you feel like he should be playing right now, mm-hmm. and you're sticking Jorge Mateo out there who is not remotely a second baseman, and I get that you want him to play against lefties. I understand that you want him to play at le- against lefties, but Jorge Mateo ain't a second baseman. And there's nothing about him that suggests that he's a second baseman other than the idea that any infielder could be a second baseman. And if that was the case, then why isn't it Jackson Holiday, right? Like, yeah. I, I, I can't shake that part of it. But in the outfield, it's not that easy. And I understand. I would like to see Colton Kowser play too. But you're trying to do two things at once where you're trying to win and you have guys that have helped you win. And you're also trying to continue development of guys that you think might be as good, if not even better, one day. Yeah, and, and I like I agree with Paul too. Like I want to see him out there more. We had a caller today that called in and said, "Why don't we sit Austin Hayes down some?" And I went, "You mean our All Star from last right. year? You want to sit right. down the guy who might be the best defensive left fielder out there?" And yeah, did you see the throw the- on opening day? I know that, that Mateo dropped it, but did you see that throw? My yeah, God! Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, like when you start, it's kind of weird. Like we're excited to see all these young players, but at the expense of what? You know, and, and it's weird. It, like, it's extremely strange to be in this situation because not too long ago we were like, oh, it yeah. doesn't you, matter who they throw out there. You, we're just kind of grinding until we get good. And then we got good faster than we thought. And then it's like, well, wait a minute. We just won the division and had the best record in the American League. What are we doing? <laughs> it's just, <laughs> what, yep. what happens now? Because I'm not sure. Do you make moves early that you wouldn't have made? Um, so they're in a tough spot. But, like, I, I really do appreciate the fact that, you know, Michael Elias came on the show to tell us that. Um, we're going to have some of the analytical guys on, I think, coming up later this week just to kind of talk about the things that they look at. So, um, yeah, I mean, like, it's, it, I don't know, man. It's just a really cool time to be a Baltimore fan. All right, what else is going on in your world? You're back to work. Did you actually do anything when you took two weeks off, or did you just sort of like – and... No, it, w- it wasn't two weeks off. It was just the way it worked out. I took off last Friday – or no, I'm sorry, hold on. Yeah, I took off last Friday. So it was really only a week. Okay, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And All then, right. well, because I tried to take off the week before and my vacation got denied because there was like, like Ed's got to have shoulder surgery and Rob was on vacation a certain, so there was only a limited amount of time for me to take any vacation. So they gave me that week and I'm like, guys, it's it's the middle of March Madness. And, and like, with all due respect to everyone at the station, like, yeah. I feel like I know as much or more college basketball than anyone. But, like, again, that's as much as what I'm saying. I'm not sitting here saying I'm smarter than everyone. So it's a week I like to work. And then I'm like, all right, well, no big deal. I'll just take some time off. And I'll, my wife and I will go to Philly. And then my business partner stole my website. And, uh, so we didn't even go on vacation. We just stayed home trying to, like, put the pieces right. back together for this thing. So we're still working on I it. Keep, I keep forgetting about that, that that little issue that you're dealing with yeah. at the moment. I mean, like I said, I, I took off, and it wasn't like anything major happened. The key bridge collapsed. Yeah. Peter Angelos died. The Orioles were sold. Um, P. Diddy's, who knows what he's diddling or doing. Have, so. you, have, you, the, have you seen the Did Diddy Do It uh, sketch? That, I don't remember who the comedian is. You have to search it. It's very, very good. It's a, I'll watch it. I haven't did, seen it yet. It's 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 just a continuous play on the word. It's 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 outstanding. It's really well performed. <laughs> I would encourage you to seek it out. All right, I will uh, check it out. Big Bad Morning Show, of course, on one hundred five seven The Fan. And then uh, the, the, tell us how, how can people sign up for your Telegram service? Yeah, all they got to do is shoot me a message. Uh, I mean, I've been getting my personal email out, which is jcon twenty two at gmail dot com, or you can hit me up on social media. Just ask to join. So right now. I'm probably going to keep it free all of April while we decide all this stuff and I get everything mapped out so it gives me a little bit of time. Going to honor the subscriptions from people that ordered from me before. It's just going to take me time to get this goober shut down and then get all my stuff back. But, um, uh, you know, it's I've been talking to people. Somebody called me altruistic, and I do try to find the best in people, and I thought I I had a really close friend, and turns out the guy's a backstabber and a liar. So. Anyway, yeah, but other than that, is, but we other than that, yeah, uh, had the, the, the play yeah, moment. right, exactly yeah. right. All right, at Jaycon Sports on Twitter, love you, buddy. Appreciate you. We'll talk yeah. to you next Monday. All right. See you guys. See you, pal. Thanks. Jeremy Con with us here on GCR. 
All right, when we come back in, three up, three down for the first, uh, not full week, but first mini week of Orioles baseball. We'll be doing that on Mondays all season long. So we'll do it for the first time next. Don't forget the print issue of Press Box still available for free at your neighborhood Royal Farms. I mean, the hundreds of locations around town where you find Press Box. Read it all at PressBoxOnline.com, diving into the 2024 Orioles. And we'll have a uh, new issue with another baseball theme on the cover coming up in just a couple of weeks. It's Glenn Clark Radio. The ultimate fan experience. Played the wrong break. We're going to throw to the break. Banner now. Day. Banner Day. Craving that classic New York deli experience? Look no further than the new Atman's Deli in Baltimore's Harbor Point. Corned beef piled high, hand-rolled bagels, and something different. A bar! Atman's has food and drink specials every day. Now open for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Dine in, grab takeout, or hang out at the bar for the next O's game. Atman's Deli, an authentic taste of Baltimore tradition since 1915. Find us at Harbor Point or visit atmansdeli.com. What company makes your home more energy efficient, purifies your air, kills all viruses, and qualifies you for $6,000 in rebates. A.J. Michaels Heating and Air Conditioning in Baltimore and Annapolis at ajmichaels.com. Whether you're celebrating a special milestone, entertaining clients, or simply enjoying a night out, count on Ruth's Chris to deliver you the finest steaks, the best service, and a level of hospitality that has made Ruth's Chris one of the most revered names in steaks since 1965. Make your reservation now at ruthschris.com. Whether your focus is luxury and comfort, convenience and technologically advanced connectivity, or sporty performance and aggressive styling, we've got the perfect Highlander for you. Check out buyatoyota.com for deals on new Highlanders from your local Toyota dealer today. The ultimate fan experience awaits you at Sports and Social Maryland. See how we're raising the sports bar with our massive 100-foot media wall featuring 40 HD TVs and a 47-foot big screen. Bet on your favorite teams and this year's biggest events at the FanDuel Sportsbook while enjoying your favorite beers and cocktails, plus our delicious takes on bar food classics. Visit Sports and Social at Live Casino in Hotel Maryland. At Arundel Mills, must be 21. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Discover one of Baltimore's hidden gems at Guilford Hall Brewery. Enjoy dinner in our spacious brew pub. Sip a signature cocktail in our outdoor dog-friendly beer garden. Or take a tour of our brewery. Discover your new favorite local craft beer. From crisp lagers to hoppy ales, there's something for everyone to enjoy. Pair your brew with delicious appetizers and entrees. There are options for the whole family, but you have to try our fan favorite giant pretzel. Guilford Hall Brewery, where every sip is a celebration. Visit us online at guilfordhall.com. The latest edition of Press Box is available now. And on the cover, we look at the promise of spring for the Baltimore Orioles as Todd Karpovich and others shine the light on the team's hopes to take the next step towards championship contention and what reinforcements could still be coming. Plus, Press Box personalities offer suggestions to David Rubenstein about stewarding the franchise. Also inside, Bo Smolko on how the Ravens' defense could evolve with new coordinator Zach Orr. And we meet lacrosse players from the men's and women's programs across the state. Press Box is available for free at over 500 area locations, including 60 Royal Farm stores. And you can always find the entire edition, as well as the best daily coverage of the O's, Ravens, and Terps at PressBoxOnline.com. Contrary to what some people believe, I actually like this guy when he sleeps. Glenn Clark, talking sports. All right, back in here on GCR as we are winding down for a Monday edition of the program. Got a new segment that we're going to be doing on Mondays throughout the course of baseball season, or if it makes more sense, we'll move it to a Tuesday, like if the Orioles, uh, for example, have a weekend series. I don't even know if there are any. Are there any of those weekend series this year where the it wraps through like a four-game series Friday to Monday? Do they have any of those? Doesn't, look, Doesn't like look like it. All right. Because it's normally what that. Boston sure. I'm, l- I'm looking at one. I'm looking at one. Uh, go down. Not that month. That month. I'm seeing one right there. Oh yeah. Yeah. How about that? Why? I could see it from here. Why? I could see it from here. No, because that's not a. There used to be a lot of those. That's not like a unique to the Patriots Day in Boston. That's a thing in baseball scheduling. Why is Tampa starting at 6:50 now? I mean, it's better than 7:05. Yeah. I mean, I. What's your beef with it? I don't know. I mean, it's just weird. I don't. I don't get why you're <laughs> just up in arms about Tampa starting 650. at six fifty. I mean, 
I always liked and why in in Arizona it was six forty that they started games. I like that. I thought that was a good time. Bought you a little bit, maybe split the difference, make it six forty five. It gave you a little bit more time if you're struggling to get there to to to, to be able to get there, but still was a little bit earlier to get you out of there earlier. I don't know. I like splitting the difference. Six forty time five is maybe my preferent preferred time, but we'll see how it goes with the Orioles and six thirty this year. So they'll be doing it all season long. Um my point is or for whatever reason, there's a rain out. they got to play a game on Monday to finish a series. We'll do it at the conclusion of a series. So if a series does not conclude on a Monday, then we'll do it on a Tuesday. If we're off on a Monday for one of the summer holidays, then we'll do it on Tuesday. But for the most part, it'll be on Mondays. Three up and three down. Not a hard concept. Yeah, we'll see. It shouldn't be. I mean, you'll probably screw it up because you're good at that. Well. It's pats and slaps. Now, Ideally, and I think you know this from Pat's, it's easy for anybody to go look at stats and just say, well, here's statistically over the last week who had the best week. The idea is to try to pull out, like, game situations. Like yesterday, that was a big spot for Adley Rushman, and he didn't come through. The problem is Adley Rushman was good enough in the first two games that you weren't going to put him on your list, right? But, like, if we did this for one game, I might put Adley Rushman on the list for yesterday because it was a big spot that he didn't come through, and it was a spot where there was value. Um I've gotten lots of yours. I think I didn't make it clear. I do want you to rank them a three, a two, and a one, like much like we do with pats and slaps. So I I, I want to go back next week. I want Griffin to do a running tally during the season of um, points-wise because that's maybe the fairest way to look at perhaps who should be team MVP at the end of the year. That, you know, we start following, into a, narr- fo- or following a narrative about who the MVP is, but then Griffin goes back and is like, by the way, you know that, like, all of your points this year have gone to – so and so, kind of weird that you think this other person is the definitive MVP. I just want to do that during the course of the year. We begin uh, pats and slaps for week one. Um, three up, three down. Sorry, yeah, thank you. See, it's difficult for me. Uh, you want to start on? You want to start positive or negative? Why don't we start positive? We'll start the three up. Yeah, all right. It's, it does well, say three up and three down, so let's go up first. Um, I mean, this one to me was the easiest it'll ever be. Like, I, I, I saw a couple of people make some arguments on Twitter for other people. So but we're reading our number one first. No, you're building up, much like oh, with okay. Pats and Slaps. You build, number one is well, you're saying it's the easiest that it's ever your been. player of the week. Well, I can do all three right now. Okay. I, if you want to argue that Gunner belonged over one of the pitchers, by all means, but this one was very easy to me. Gunner, Grayson, Corbin Burns. I, Gunner. Okay. Gunner three. Grayson two, Corbin Burns one. I will send this to you to post on the website. Okay, so you don't Gunner have to write it one down. Point. Gunner would get one point. It's not. Why are we struggling so much with this? Corbin Burns would get three points. Um. You know, Gunner Henderson's been awesome, and beyond just you know a four for ten start, a triple, and a home run, the three walks are what has maybe stood out to me the most about Gunner Henderson's start to the season. Gunner's been phenomenal. Um. You know, Grayson was spectacular on Saturday, but nothing can touch the theater, the moment, the all of it of what Corbin Burns did on opening day. It it really will, depending on how this season goes, there's a possibility that that will be remembered as one of the more significant individual performances. Like, uh, clearly, Cedric Mullins hitting for the cycle last year and then making that catch as well. I'm gonna remember that for a long time. And finishing the which, cycle which with the hit? home run, well, the one that he, the one that he made the night that he fin- hit for the cycle. Because I get it. The the there's other things. Everything memorable from last year all involves Cedric Mullins. John Means throwing the no hitter in Seattle, of course, will go up there. But something about it being opening day. We always we eternally remember Rick Sutcliffe because it was the first game at the stadium on opening day in '92. If the Orioles were to go do something this year, I feel like the Corbin Burns opening day start could go down as one of the great opening day memories in Orioles history. I mean, it was just that electric in that building watching him do that. So, um, yeah, it was an easy for me. I'll give it all right at once. Three, Gunner, two, Grayson, one, Corbin Burns. Okay, got it. Um, And now, like, pats and slaps, we're, we're, are we grouping in, you know, Coaches, managers, and yeah, any if way. you want to, uh, manager. Let's not go crazy with coaches beyond that. I don't, no I don't front wanna. office or no, no, we don't do any of that. Just right. on the field, right, just on the field. Okay, all right. Let me figure out. Let me re- readjust what were you my want, list. What did you want to put on your list? Um, 
I don't know, well, I guess I'll save it for when I was going to get to it. Uh, so my number three, then. We're going down for three up. Yes. Getting one point. Yeah. Anthony Santander. Yeah, thought, okay. I mean, I thought uh, four RBIs on opening day. I, I, and I think he had a great up. week. I just yeah, don't think you yeah. can argue him over any of those three guys. I just don't think that there is an argument for it. Okay. I thought he had a great week. I think Santander is going to be a big, big part of this team. And, I, you know, we talked I about don't, I don't disagree packaging with Hayes, it, like Austin Hayes with somebody and somebody else and Santander and that. I, I feel like Santander is going to be be so good that I, th- we can't imagine I, this team without him. And, um, and, uh, maybe. I, 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 think, think, I, think, I think you're traipsing, I think you're traipsing into hyperbole there. I, and in fact, I would say you're going beyond traipsing. Like, you're going into full-blown hyperbole. Like, it's almost absurd hyperbole. I have no problem with the significance of Anthony Santander, and we've talked about that. that like, you can talk about him being a trade piece, but he's also your best middle-of-the-order, most consistent middle-of-the-order hitter at the same time. So, like, it's a complicated conversation. You're going, like, six steps beyond that. And that's too much. But also, if you put him on the list over Gunnar Henderson, like Santander, no walks, two strikeouts. Gunnar Henderson, the opposite. Yeah. Well, actually, better than the opposite of that. Uh, that's why Gunnar is my number two. Right. On and the so list. leaving off one of these pitchers is badass. Okay. Well, like, it's then I badass. Guess, all right. It's Pitching's easy. So it's no, it's not. <laughs> it's insane. Uh, and then my number one is Corbin Burns. That's fine. Leaving Grayson Rodriguez off your list is just. What are we doing? We're I mean, there's a lot of good of players on this that's team. That's fine. But be, you have to acknowledge in the context of the week. There's 26 guys on the it, roster, and i got to leave all. With all due respect to Anthony Santander, what he did in comparison to what his job is versus what Grayson Rodriguez did, it's there's it's not close. Grayson Rodriguez was brilliant. He scored 25 Anthony runs Santander runs was good. Dude, I hear you. It's tough to leave some of those cats off. But one of them was genius. One of them did a yeah, offered you a masterpiece. Mm-hmm. Another one was good. And he'll be on the list, uh, I'm sure, throughout the season. Maybe the case, but your list is dumb. <laughs> With I mean, all due respect. I mean, leaving Grayson Rodriguez off your list is like I. It, it's tri- It it borderlines on the things that we've talked about in the past. Where like we just can't make lists. All right, I'll copy like, you from moving no, on. The rest I don't need of you to season. copy me. Copy although you, this week right was way. easy. I'll do it the right way. And basically, everyone else got it. <laughs> Like, this was yeah, an yeah, easy, easy Glenn. week for okay. three. No, I don't That's think we'll I, do. they sent theirs before they ever heard mine. It was a very easy week for the up part. The down part, obviously, was a bit more difficult this week. Although, great, you know, Griffin scr- struggled with the up, so I don't know. I mean, somehow he might have Grayson Rodriguez on his down list. We just might not be probably capable forgot of doing him. That's probably what it should have been. Maybe working a curveball. I don't know. Jeez. <laughs> I take it back. We're not doing this segment. It took me all of one week. We were thinking about Not putting it out there for sponsors to see if they were interested in getting a be a part of the segment. Don't, don't, don't get on. Let me put it to bed. After one week, I've changed my mind. Down, three down. Um, they're a good, good player. They're all good players. I agree Harvard. that they're that Santander's I don't feel a, good about what, leaving you, off. You know. 20, 20 of these guys. Um, I disagree like, with that. I think I don't. I, you know, it's funny. I didn't think that the list. It's it, for as many runs as were scored. I, there weren't as many players that demanded a spot on the list as I thought there were. I mean, I struggled like, with no one a third for my down. Yeah, th- that part, absolutely. Like for example, Dylan Tate is my number three, but it was very unique too because his second appearance was totally fine. It was his first appearance, right? Dylan Tate. And particularly because there was a bit more of a spotlight on him, given as we think about what the trouble might be in the bullpen, our hope is that Dylan Tate's return and a return to form could go a ways into easing our concerns about the bullpen. So there's this greater there was this greater spotlight on Dylan Tate, and his first appearance was rough. Now, again, he turned around, then he pitched the next, or I guess he pitched yesterday, right? Yeah, yeah, it yeah yesterday? he pitched yesterday. Yeah, it's hard for me to remember. Separate days, and he was totally fine. So it's a, it's a, right. I, it, it's I, difficult to kind of to your point. I feel like the organization. I mean, they never said anything, but I feel like feel like by not making any moves, they kind of made it seem like Dylan Tate was somewhat their answer yes. you know, for these bullpen holes. Yes. and you know, but it just looks very shaky on opening day. For the first one with that in measuring by that standard of we need Dylan Tate to be the 2021 version say we and I said 2021 2022 version of Dylan Tate in order to ease the concerns about the biggest area of concern for the team 
it was a tough it was tough sledding to see that be the first thing that Dylan Tate does this year. So it it's not putting Dylan Tate on this list is not me saying Dylan Tate stinks and everything is a disaster. It's in a week where there weren't a lot of guys to beat up. Somebody's you know got to take it on the chin, and Dylan Tate took it on the chin on opening day and with a bigger spotlight that stood out for me. So Dylan Tate is my number three on my down list. Let's see how your down list goes. Um, yeah, so my number three, uh, I'm going to have to put Mateo here just for, you know, kind of the, the, the defensive troubles yeah, on the opening defensive day. defensive troubles uh, at, at second base. That's your guy, too. That's I gotta, know. Well, I mean, I was honestly you. thinking about putting him on the, the, the plus list, the three up list. Uh, right. But um, but I d- decided, uh, you know, he's really the only guy that you can point to. And, I again, I don't feel like it's his fault. I thought he played really well in those first two games. And, uh, um, I guess, offensively, just because – Maybe we, 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 we expected uh, – we forgot that it was going to be March, April, Jorge Mateo. Um, so maybe we should have expected right, uh, him correct. to be Right, Early season, fine. Jorge Mateo yes. offensively is a menace. But the defensive uh, is – you know, it's a lot of – a lot of I didn't, questionable – I, I, In fairness – And I want to see Jackson Holiday, and that's why it sticks out more. I, and, and by the way, it's funny because defensively yesterday, maybe McCann is the guy that should have made the list. Right. But he's – He's the backup catcher. It's like I, I didn't put him on the list is yeah. what I'm, I'm about to say. He's not on my list. Um, Dylan Tate was my number two. Dylan Tate's your number two. Okay, very good. My number two is Tyler Wells, and I get it. He bounced back nicely, but he didn't start nicely, and I can't pretend. Like, the game matters in the first and second inning, too. And because we use terms like quality start, we end up painting a picture that doesn't fully show maybe what what happened you spread four runs out over six innings maybe give up one in the second two in the fifth one in the sixth that looks a little bit different than when you give up four in the first two innings and you're getting rocked and it's not to say that it should and it doesn't absolve the lineup of their lack of production but it Setting the tone is a term that we use a lot in baseball, and the tone was set yesterday that this might not be our day. Now, yes, I'm very aware. Tyler Wells ultimately settled down nicely, and if what you get moving forward from Tyler Wells looks like the four innings that he pitched after the first two yesterday, you're going to be really happy with Tyler Wells the rest of the season. But in acknowledging what happened yesterday, we can't hide behind quality start and what Tyler Wells ultimately ended up doing to forget that a lot of the games seemed to be determined in the first two innings yesterday. He did battle back, and there's plenty of reason to be encouraged about Tyler Wells, but he was getting rocked early in the game. And they were aggressive. They appeared to have no fear going after him. Like, they were swinging early in the count, and they were making really solid contact against Tyler Wells. So, you know, I tear down and build up, I saw the same thing everybody else did. I hope Tyler Wells looks more like that guy that we saw moving forward, but in a small sample size that we have to work with and you know, only a few guys that we can really call out. Tyler Wells in the first two innings yesterday was you know, may- maybe the, one of the worst things that we've seen so far of Orioles baseball. So, Tyler Wells is my number 2. Um yeah, I mean, I was pretty encouraged and okay with you know the way he was able to bounce back over the next I, four well, innings. Again, it's so fine to say that. I have Tyler no Wells problem I no problem saying it. And I'm not going to beat you up over this one. The first one's embarrassing. I'm not beating you up well, over this because the totality of it is I, I get the argument. It's just unique to me too. The game seemed to be determined in those first two innings yesterday. Ramon Arias is uh, my number one. He is and my number one as well. Yeah. Um, and you know I feel like not ne- really necessarily his fault. You, you had three chances defensively um, all, all weekend. He didn't get a hit. Yep. And, you know, it just seems like it's kind of like it, he's the guy that's there. It's Why that, it wasn't is, Westbrook playing third base on opening it's day? It's the tough – what you're alluding to is the tougher part and the part that maybe is, is not – This is why I asked, you know, managers, GMs, like is this something that – because that I feel like it was a very good, you know, opening weekend. Who would you weekend. have put – you would have put Hyde on for Hyder playing? Elias. I, no, Hyder Elias. I'm, I'm trying to figure out, you know, like just because I'm so 
disappointed with the fact that oh, Holiday Jackson Holiday thing, not yeah, here. but that doesn't have that's and not the first three weeks. It's not in games. That wouldn't that wouldn't count. Well, I mean, when we're trying to look at you know the downside of what was a very good week, that was this. Well, seems it's, to be the it's point a bummer. That we keep yeah, I agree, it's a bummer, but it's, it's not. Like, we're, we're, we're talking about the games here. We're not talking about the. the, the this is for analyzing the games. Um, it is tougher though what you're alluding to. Ramon Arias is going to be judged more harshly because you're like you're the, the placeholder. The number one, ba- the number one prospect in baseball is right. Like, like you, the re is the reason why Jack. That we we would hear that Stan would talk about. It. Other people would talk about it. Well, they don't want to give up on a Ramon Arias for nothing. Well, he better be worth more than nothing. Like that. This is the tricky part for Ramon Arias is that now he's being judged beyond just does he collect some hits? Does he? He's going to be judged now moving forward until Jackson Holiday's here is you're kind of the guy that's here that's preventing the guy we want to have here from being here. And you could say that's unfair because maybe Ramon Arias would be here anyway. Maybe in their world, if they thought that Jackson Holiday was totally ready to play second base, they would want Ramon Arias on the team anyway and they would – have to fi- I don't know what that it would be, but they'd have to figure something else out in order to clear that roster spot. Maybe Colton Kowser wouldn't have made the team, and Jorge Mateo would have been the reserve outfielder. I, I don't know. But that's what it feels like. It feels like Ramon Arias is holding Jackson Holiday's spot. And so it does present a bigger spotlight, and we are paying more attention, and we are saying to themselves ourselves, is this justified? Now, to be fair... um. On Saturday, he also made a hell of a defensive play, right? Like you say, he didn't get that many opportunities. Yeah, right, exactly. But the one on Saturday, and I can't, I'm trying to remember Is where it the was. The line drive, the yeah, the one? smoke, yeah, the ball yeah, that yeah. was smoked. Um, and well, and to the point though, I mean, Kevin Kevin Brown made the point. He was like, I don't know how much. Yeah, he just caught that ball, or that, the ball caught him. Yeah. yeah, I do remember him saying that. Which but was it was a, it was a good play, I think, because he had he had to move to get to it. So he yeah. had to, he had to move, and right. that's not. Is it a routine? It'd be unfair to call it a routine play. Yeah. It's, it's definitely it, a base hit. If it is it a him. play like, that that a major league third baseman should make? Yeah, pro- it, it's probably a fair way. It's not exceptional. It's not. Oh my God, Ramon Arias is back. But it's a reminder that if the metrics said last year he was an awful defensive third baseman, which is what they did, that didn't look like an awful third baseman on Saturday when he okay. caught that smoke line drive. So that's that's a good thing. Um, but yeah, we're we're measuring Ramona Rios by you're the guy that's here and Jackson Holiday isn't. So because of that, yeah, I, he's also number one on my list for down this week. Three up and three down. We will post them at glenclarkradio.com until I get frustrated enough with Griffin's list that I say we're not doing it any longer. <laughs> until I get to that. Let's point. get used to it. Yeah. We can disagree. It's totally fine to disagree. We think Grayson Rodriguez up oh, this is badass. All right, uh, let's get a tidbit. Tidbit is brought to you today. I, I, John wanted me to talk more. I, I, you know what's funny, John? We actually tried to reach out to both Rebecca Lobo and Holly Rowe this morning to see if we could track down somebody to come on. I am very excited about it. I, I'm, I'm furious because it's the 7 o'clock game and not the 9 o'clock game tonight. And I, of course, play trivia on Mondays. By the way, we might need you tonight. Um, I'm at the radio station on Mondays. What the hell are you doing over there? DVT and... What, what is that Cordell, all Cordell about? wants me to hang around, I think. You know. He wants you to hang around. Or are you Cordell produ- needs me. You're producing Cordell's show. Correct. Okay. Well, well, are you or not? We're co-hosting, basically. Oh, <laughs> that's what it is. It's the Cordell and Griffin show. Um, so I'm very frustrated because that game will be going on. Both the baseball game and that game will that's be going right, on. Yeah. Where I was hoping that it would work out. That was forgetting that the other. Oh, by the way, we haven't talked about the Portland thing. The Portland thing is hilarious. I mean, it's it's embarrassing. But oh, yeah. what a, the NCAA just always reminding you they're they're nailing it those that 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 organization. If you didn't see it yesterday, the three point line was wrong on one side of the floor in Portland. To be fair, it was wrong for one half for both teams, right? So it, it's you can't say it's unfair; it's just inaccurate. Um. But yeah, because one of the regionals is in Portland, they switch that a couple. Years. Unlike in on the men's side, where they have four different um, sites, on the women's side they have just two different sites, and they play games there every day during the the second weekend. 
So the the second game tonight, the UConn, w- w- not UConn. Yeah, UConn USC, right? The second game, yeah, uh, UConn USC, yeah, yeah. which is also awesome. Like, b- by the way, this night might be the greatest total night in the history of women's basketball between LSU Iowa and UConn USC. It's kind of a bummer that this is an Elite Eight and we didn't get a whole week to build up to it and not, like, I mean, South Carolina is the best team. So, like, you wouldn't want South Carolina yeah. to not – like, you want to say this – you wish this was the Final Four, but you don't. You want South Carolina to be in the Final Four. So, I don't know who you would remove from this group. Maybe UConn, but – Probably. Paige Becker is a lot of fun to watch play. Um, you wish – you wish this was something that we had a whole week to build up to because this is this is a great night of basketball. And particularly obviously LSU Iowa, which we're you know, this is the one we wanted all year. Again, would rather it be next weekend, but it's gonna be pretty good. I just damn it. I'm really, really bothered by how many things are gonna be it's gonna be super awkward when I'm asking for somebody else's phone at the table tonight <laughs> so that I can have both the Orioles game and the basketball game up on a screen while I'm also trying to play trivia. It's going to be a very uncomfortable situation if anyone for all can parties do it. involved. Yeah, I'll be we the believe, hero. We believe I'll you. be the hero tonight. Yeah, I, I look. Um, what, what is Iowa favored by? They are favored by a point and a half, I believe. Okay. Um, two, according oh, to two, Superbook okay. right now. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's I, very tough, right? It feels like Hitler Clark's inevitable right now. It's a little bit that, and also this season they have been more balanced. Like, that's the part of Caitlin Clark's game that's maybe been overlooked the most is, like, the assists. Like, mm. And part of that is just she demands so much attention that you're getting a lot of open shooters. LSU has looked disjointed. We saw it in the Middle Tennessee game. Um, we definitely saw it in the UCLA game. Now, they beat a good UCLA team ultimately, and they pulled away late. Uh, Flu J. Henderson has been phenomenal during this tournament. She's been awesome. As good as Angel Reese is, she's been awesome. Um, I think Iowa deserves to be favored. I would probably argue that Iowa probably deserves to be favored by more like three points, but that doesn't mean that I'm confident that Iowa's going to win. That's a loaded LSU team. The, the yeah. real question is why LSU wasn't more consistent during, consistent during the course of the season than it is – are they capable of beating Iowa? They're definitely capable of beating Iowa. Whether any of these teams are capable of beating South Carolina, that's sort of the weird part about this night is that like you have all of this, this great theater, and I don't know that any of them can ultimately beat South Carolina. South Carolina minus two, t- 210 to win the NCAA I'm surprised championship. that's all it is. Yeah. Um, I guess that'll go up a little bit because two more teams will be out of it at the end of the night. You can do South Carolina. Okay, yeah. You can get the field at plus 170. Plus 170 for the field against South Carolina. How about that? Um, look, South Carolina is the team to beat. There's no question about that. It's indisputable. But LSU definitely can beat Iowa tonight. There's no doubt about that. Will they? I, this is where the conspiracy theorists come into play. Like, what you know, ESPN desperately wants to make sure Iowa's there next weekend. It's one thing that they lost the championship game last year because there were no more games to be played. So there's the conspiracy theorists of, like, are ESPN and NCAA in cahoots? And, like, will the officials call the game a certain way to try to make sure? Ca- I don't like going into those places at all. Um, I, there's obviously also a lot more at stake for Caitlin Clark here. As great as Caitlin Clark is, she loses tonight. You know, she'll be measured by, well, but she couldn't win the big one. Right? Like, that's what she'll be measured by. And... That's the first time we'll ever feel that way about a women's basketball player. I don't. I can't think of any other player that we had that conversation about over the years. But that's the microscope she's under, is if she loses tonight, she will be remembered as a great player, but that ultimately... How many big three championships will she have to win to make up for it? And I, I, so we could do 20 minutes on that, and I'd have no interest in it. Like, th- There's so much meta there. Like, Do they know that she's... Th- the nonsense of the state... Feel however you want to feel about Ice Cube. Ice Cube to me is a legendary figure that has had a lot of questionable judgment in recent years, and I've, I, I've, I found myself not sure what to make of Ice Cube. Uh, as an artist, obviously, you know, great musician, great actor, the whole thing. A lot of things that he's said and done in recent years, I've sort of been like, dude, what? It's moving towards the like you think you're smarter than you are because of some of the success that you've had. 
the statement that he put out about the big three thing is we think it's you know reprehensible or detestable or whatever he, words he used to describe the idea of women having to go play in other countries the rest of the year. Uh, okay, but the big three season runs at the same time as the WNBA season does. So the issue isn't that they'd have to go play in other countries. They'd be able to play here in America. The statement doesn't hold water. The statement is that you're really attacking the WNBA. I saw somebody, I think they like looked at the schedule and I guess they looked at like the Indiana Fever schedule because mm-hmm. that's who she's going to get drafted by. And like they don't, I don't think they have, or maybe there's like one overlapping day or something. There's absolutely no world in which the WNBA team would be okay with you right. playing in another league while you're playing for that. Like, y- unless they are. You like, I don't know. No, no, that's not, th- it's not an unless they are. We can we can say we can scoff at how much money you are getting paid in the WNBA, but like Caitlin Clark's going to make six figures. You don't hire someone to make six figures to then say, but hey, go ahead and tear your ankle the night before the game playing in some other league. Like it don't work that way. Y- you can do that in some other sports. Like I, I'd be interested still even like at the PLL if they're able to in their contracts, you know, do the same thing. And the WNBA might not like the idea of what you know players playing. Well, if their options are you have Caitlin Clark or not, no Caitlin Clark, then I I understand what you think you're saying, mm-hmm. and the WNBA would say then we're not going to have Caitlin Clark. Okay, that's the answer. The answer is not going to be you can try to play in two leagues at once, like at the exact same time. The the WNBA is too professional of a league to let that happen. That can happen in fly by night where you're not practicing, where you're not gathering for team meetings I, I i would i would like to know what the pll you know would say about something like that my gut is in the pll if there's some box league that you want to play in during the week you can go right ahead and play in that box league during the week because they're 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 not they're still a weekend league the wnba isn't just a weekend league um you're an employee you're you're really working for that team so if that was the if that really was the situation the answer would be then we're not gonna have caitlin clark like, that's just the way that it's going to go. And that would suck for them. But Caitlin Clark wouldn't do that. I, the other thing that I appreciate about this is that this could be a good way for bargaining and for negotiating with WNBA and trying to figure out how to get salaries up. And until we see Caitlin Clark understands her, it seems to anyway, understand her role in I've got the opportunity to lift the sport. And the way you do that isn't abandoning the sport. And this nonsense big three, th- the other part, too, that nobody wants to say out loud, if it's just Caitlin Clark, nobody's watching. It's a novelty for the first game. You tune in to see that, and then you realize this ain't, this ain't a thing. It would somehow require the big three replacing the WNBA, which it's never going to do. It's This is a gimmick, and presumably a gimmick that well, that's why I almost feel like there may be some, you know, way it works because the big three no. is a gimmick. Like, that, do we really think that she, they, like, if she's out there going 50% in this league? The, the WNBA. She's, all she's got to do is hit a 35-footer, no, a couple 35-footers. No, we cannot participate in that. It, it is, it openly mocks your league. No, this doesn't, Steph Curry can't go play in another basketball league the night before he plays an NBA game. You can't openly mock the league by doing this. You get to choose. The rest, the rest of the year, we get it. You can go make money playing in an, another league somewhere. But while we're playing, this is the league you're playing in. And, and again, it's different for like the indoor soccer league. They, they don't have TV contracts. They're not paying you six figures in order to play in that league. So they understand, like, hey, we're paying you – peanuts if on friday night you got to go play in some league somewhere else we're not going to be thrilled about it we're not going to love it but we can't stop you from doing it the wnba will not participate in this charade they 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 can't because also it's an extension of the nba like they cannot participate in this type of charade and openly mock your league this way there is a zero percent chance of that now if at some point the big three says, hey, we're not really getting traction doing things the way that we're doing it, and we want to figure out a way to get traction, 
it might be a moment for the big three to think about whether or not they can take three-on-three basketball and get more female stars to play in a three-on-three league. The problem being they'd have to run it at the same time as the NBA is running. You, you can't run it during WNBA season. But yeah, there, that could, that. there might be a moment here. It's just that you're going to be in an awfully com- – th- what the big three thinks they have is people that like basketball have no basketball to watch during the summer. They're coming to Baltimore this year, by the way, the big three. They're going to play at the CFG Bank Arena. They think that if you love basketball, you'll come out and watch – I know Joe Johnson played in it briefly. You'll come out and watch. I, I can't even think of Dante Green uh, was a local guy that was involved, but like there aren't. I don't know who even the names might have been in the league last year, because for the most part, those cats don't need money. They don't need this. So the guys that maybe like you might be willing to say, hey, what does Tracy McGrady look like at 46 years old playing basketball? But Tracy McGrady doesn't need to embarrass himself and try to go out and do this because he's got plenty of money. So the guys that you can get to play in the league are the guys that aren't absurdly wealthy and then that's why they're struggling to scratch the surface because how much do you really want to go out and watch i'm trying to think of a, an appropriate name to put in this so i'm not knocking how much how badly do you want to go see jake layman play basketball right now well kind of it's minimal it's minimal i don't even know that jake layman would play in the big three i'm pretty sure he would continue to just play overseas I don't remember who was in the big three last year. Was the was there uh, a were there any really prominent players in the big three last Mario year? Mario Chalmers was in it. Yeah, okay. Michael Beasley. It's the closest thing. Brandon Rush. Yeah. Tony Allen. This is just one team. I, I, there's no like a full rock. I have to go team by team here. All right, whatever, <laughs> whatever. The it, aliens. Like the big three is one of those things that seems like a cool idea, but it's just you're always going to be capped by what the interest level could be. So I would listen to an argument for the big three to say, how could we do this and make it work? And if we took our games into all non-NBA markets, right? Like, if that's what this looked like. Ooh, Leandro Barbosa. I did love Leandro. I, was, I love the Brazilian blur. Oh, my doing. God. I love Leandro Bar- Bar- Barbosa. I don't think it would get me to watch the big three, but, like. Jared Jack. If you took that, that highest group of players – and combine that with women's stars, genuine stars, the top female stars, and you brought that into Baltimore and Louisville and Hartford and those types of markets in the fall and winter, could you get some traction? Nick Young. No, no thank you. I I mean, the other problem there would be there's not really a – no network needs more content because they all have college games. So I, it might be that the only time you can run it is the summer. But if you're running it the summer, you can't do this. You're not going to be able to get the top. In, in, unless they all decided together, and I find that very hard to believe, that they would all decide together to jump ship to go to the big three because I don't think the other part of this is like they might be willing to offer this money to Caitlin Clark, but they've yet to show that they could – they could offer this to everyone. Everyone else is going to say, well, right, you're making real money because you're the gimmick. They offered us the same money that we're making in the WNBA to play gimmick basketball. No thank you. So until it's everyone, this is nothing. I mean, this is – could – could here's the best I could give you. Could the WNBA, in the name of attention, work out an agreement to let her play, like, one game? For this season, maybe, yeah, until, like – yeah, if the big three figures out, like maybe they want to do I, I, like Friday I, nights or something during football season. Yeah, like, but I just I don't think they're going to. I yeah. may, until the NFL takes over Friday night football. Correct. Uh, but they're they're doing Wednesdays next year, so um, I, I could see maybe some, and even that I'm 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 hard pressed to buy that they would do it. But maybe they could do a thing for like one game. The hey, Caitlin Clark playing against the, and then people would watch that, and then they could think that that's valuable for them, but. I'd still be surprised if they would allow her to do even even one game. I don't think. I also I, I don't know if we ever got like a thought from Caitlin Clark about whether or not this is something like I think that's the part focused about this on winning too. A championship right it's now. not just that she's focused on winning a championship. I my gut is she seems very smart. She can see right through this. Mm-hmm. And you're not making me a gimmick. Right. You're not, yeah. You're I not think, doing that. I think like I think to your point like she like wouldn't leave the WNBA. It's just not just this. that she wouldn't leave the WNBA. Yeah. I think she's probably in her heart of hearts offended by it. Like, 
you're not offering me you, you're trying to suggest that you're doing something altruistic you're not doing that at all you're trying to m manipulate me in the name of getting yourself attention get the entire f out of here with that like i'm i'm not going to be a part of your game i get it we all like money no everybody likes money but this is nonsense and caitlin clark also by the way is going to have plenty of like and she's already in every State Farm commercial. Where she's th this, doing there's okay. this this dumb line that we keep repeating about how much more valuable these these female uh, basketball players are in college than they will be in the WNBA because we use the WNBA salary. Like I know some of the NIL money will go away. That's uniquely tied to the collective at the school. Some of it will. Not even all of that will, because whatever the Iowa collective is. Presumably, a lot of those businesses still want to be associated with Caitlin Clark because I'm going to guess she's still going to be very popular in Iowa even as she goes to the WNBA. Maybe she'll come back next year. Uh, she already said she's going to return. Yeah. No, she's gone. Angel, I think, though, is probably going to come back and play at LSU is next year. Is this Dang Play her junior year? Or is I think it's th – but she still has the oh, – um, she, she had, like, a legit red shirt. Or either a legit red shirt or she might still be the beneficiary of the COVID year. Right. She well, I guess still... everyone technically is, but – Yeah, Right? Is that right? No, that can't be right. Well, I think no, she has to. We still have a few. I don't remember. I don't remember, but I feel like Angel Reese does have one more year of eligibility that she could use. She's listed as a junior. She's listed as a junior. All right. How many is that? I thought she played two years. Why did I think she played two years at Maryland? I think it was only one. Yeah. Was it really only one year? Yeah. Jeez, that's crazy. She um, was. Yeah, last year was her. Yeah, last year was her first season with LSU. Well, I knew that. I just yeah. thought she played two years at Maryland before that. I thought it was two years at Maryland and then two years at LSU for some reason. I don't. And then maybe I thought she might have gotten hurt. In one oh wait, of those yeah, years. yeah, it was two seasons. At Thank Maryland. you. Okay. Well. <sighs> so one of those was a how many? I guess one of those had to be a legit redshirt. How many games did she play? Because I do remember her getting hurt at one point. Uh, let's see. Her LSU page does not want to reference much of Maryland. You can find it on ESPN.com. Uh, it's twelve thirty-six. What are we doing? What are we doing? We thought here? we didn't have a show today. Damn it! Well, but this is John's fault because he asked me to talk more about it. She played fifteen games in that first season, so I maybe that's enough that she was able to earn a oh, red man, shirt. She looked good in the Maryland game. Though. She did, <laughs> sure did. It's a shame, it's a shame. But I'm happy for her. And I look. I there's no. I Kim Mulkey is quite unlikable to me, but I root for Baltimore. I get it that everybody can say for the sport that it's good if Iowa wins tonight, but like I root for Baltimore. I'm rooting for Angel Reese. Period. End of story. I, there is no. It's not like she went to Duke, or yeah, or anywhere yeah, else. Yeah, a hundred percent. Like if she went to Duke, I wouldn't root for her. But I'm rooting for Angel Reese tonight. Plain and simple. I hope she wins. I hope she wins another national championship. And then I won't like that because it means Kim Mulkey gets another championship and she is in as insufferable as it gets. But I'm rooting for Angel Reese, period, plain and simple. I don't know why that would even be a hard concept. I can't imagine being – if you live in this area and you're conflicted, look at yourself in a mirror. Caitlin Clark's fun and great for hoops, and I love her, but you have no association with Caitlin Clark. Meanwhile, a young woman from Randallstown is at the forefront of – Sports. I, how is this hard? You you might you might be learning something about yourself if you're confused about how to root in this game. Now, tidbit. Is it something we need to do today? Can we I hold mean, it for tomorrow? I guess I could probably hold it. It's twelve thirty six. I don't know what just happened. All right, all right, quickly. Life. Tidbit quickly. Brought to you by <sighs> County Sports Zone and Toyota. <laughs> County Sports Zone is probably sponsored by your local Toyota dealer. Buyatoyota.com. Get over there for the latest in high school uh, stats, scores, updates, everything you need to know uh, for baseball and softball, boys and girls lacrosse. You can find it all at countysports.zone, proudly sponsored by your local Toyota dealer, and buyatoyota.com. All right, I can save. Yeah, I can save that one. Uh, all right, let's do this one. Uh, the most wins, so since September 1st of last year, uh, guaranteed rate field, the home park of the Chicago White Sox. They have won three games uh, since September 1st of last year at their home ballpark. There are three other teams that have won uh, at least three games and one team that has won more than three games than the White Sox have at their own ballpark uh, since September 1st of last year. Of course, they – I guess I'll just I, give it I to mean, you. I mean, yeah. I, they it, got swept by the Tigers. Okay. Right. <laughs> so the Tigers have six wins since September 1st of last year uh, at Guaranteed Rate Field. Uh, the Padres well, did you see the one that Jake Cuda did? I, I might have changed yesterday, but, like, for the first couple of days of the year, the furthest on the base pass your team has reached, and it was a graphic, and it was first, second, third home – 
and it, everybody in the home <laughs> and Chicago on first. Oh man, yeah, because I, I, I assume shot the first two games. Yeah, I yeah. assume that, that that probably changed yesterday. I, not that I'm paying attention. But by the way, I might allow you to bring back another segment. I know we didn't do uh, fighting words last week. We had a uh, we were trying to get out of here to get yeah. to the baseball game on Thursday. And what the hell were we going to talk about? The cat that that bit the dude. Is that what we we're going to talk about in fighting words? I, that was unbelievable. That was really unbelievable. Uh, it, was, it was it was good. more unbelievable that he was trying to fight about it. Like. No! no, I didn't do it. And then the guy they're showing his the arm. Most, the, the most egregious like, bite mark that you have, I've ever seen in my life. Like, like I've never the, seen a bite mark. But this, that but this defined. is how detached we are from reality. He obviously bit the guy. Nearly got away with it. Like it took a second. Yeah, right, was like he was like, yeah, whoa, whoa. Like, like they stopped. Right? Like, it, what's going it on? It took Let, seeing the guy's arm to understand that like he really had been bit. Like people on the internet were like, what? They stop, what are you stopping the fight for? Until you saw it, and then you're like, oh, we get it now. And the guy was protesting. Like, no, I didn't. Do, that must have been from the air. <laughs> so insane. Um, but, no, we didn't do fighting words last week. We'll, 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 do, we'll try to do fighting words this week. It's not a big week this week either. Uh, everybody's up in arms because they're going to use 16-ounce gloves in the Mike Tyson, Jake Paul. You, if you thought this was a fight, this is on you. It's not on them. Let's give them brass knuckles and fight each other. Stop thinking that they're the problem here. You're the problem here. Anyway, sorry. That's my impromptu fighting words. We might do fighting words this week. We'll definitely do it next week because there's a big fight week. Yeah. Um, I might think about having you bring back this week in the rest of baseball oh, that, okay. uh, that Grant used to do. Yes. Did we ever have a nickname for Grant? I don't remember if he had a nickname. Because um, um, I do want to be in tune with the rest of baseball. And admittedly... Especially right now, with like the tournament still going on, I'm not paying attention to any. Like last night, I was watching Maryland lacrosse. That was huge. We'll talk about it with Patrick oh, yeah. tomorrow. Maryland down eight four at the half, looking like their season was hanging on in the on the brink. Like if Maryland loses to Penn State, it's not like they can't get into the tournament, but it's going to take like a miracle almost at that point. That was massive in the second half for Maryland lacrosse. So once the basketball ended, I watched that. Um, I'm not yet to the place where I'm watching other baseball just yet. So I might have you do that as well at some point. We'll talk about Went it. Went 2-0 in my fantasy leagues this weekend. There you go. You're pretty the pretty expert. Yeah, yeah. Pretty good. Um, the Maybe it could uh, be a Friday feature while Stan's here. Okay, yeah. We saw be good. I think Steck had told me Stan went something like 28 in a row before he got one wrong from you on Friday. Uh, but that, we did 28. Yeah, Steck was counting. I, I'll pull it up and make sure I have that Jeez. number right. That's crazy. All right, well, I'll stump him again this week. Uh, I mean, should have been perfect. Probably. NC State, uh, they become the second school to send both its men's and women's team to the Final Four in the same season, with at least one of the teams being a double-digit seed. So, of course, the NC State men, NC State men mm, are the 11th 11 seed. seed. Yep. What was the only other instance where both schools made the Final Four and mm. one of them... So, how would I ever get was this? ...was a double-digit. Both schools made the Final Four, one of them made a double-digit seed. Um, Stanford... North Carolina. It'll start with an S. Does start with an and S. And it was in the last decade. Syracuse. Syracuse. Is I, don't remember them making women. I don't remember them making the women's Final Four. 2016, they made it. The men were the, the 10 seed. That yeah, season. I do kind of remember that. I remember that. So that was, uh, like, since I was still in high school, we did, like, our little homeroom thing. Like, we would get assigned, like, a Sweet 16 team, and we got Syracuse. We were like, oh, we're screwed because oh. they're a 10 seed. All right. And they made a run to the well, Final Four, that? and we were almost won a pizza party. It would have been. Would have been big, uh, but they did not win the national championship. So, uh, and Jeremy th <laughs> sent me what he thought was an answer. Unfortunately, this appears to be a fake. <laughs> he was sending me a, a what he thought was an answer about the conjoined twins, uh -huh. like that, like maybe they had addressed it. Um, they didn't. It's not. It's fake. It's not their Twitter account. I really got it. Yeah. I'm trying to figure out which tidbit I want to save and all right, use. We we got it. We got to go. Man. Okay, it's right, twelve well, forty four. Uh, we'll do since the rest of the rest of baseball. So since RBI became an official uh, an official stat, uh, so what nineteen twenty two players in a four game span have had nine hits, nine RBI, six walks, four homers, a six hundred batting average. Mookie Betts did it over the his first I guess his last four games. Okay, uh, and the only other player to do this. The history of baseball. Yeah. Nine hits, nine RBIs, six walks, four homers. Chris Davis. <laughs> Close. Babe Ruth. Babe Ruth. Yeah, there we go. Is the answer. Yeah. Mookie Betts and Babe Ruth. It uh, had to be relevant. Very good. And then from Dan Connolly, Santander uh, is the first Oriole to homer in consecutive games to start the season since 2020. 
<laughs> you think I remember anything about 2020? Iglesias. No. I don't know. Who? Rio Ruiz. Oh, Rio, the great Rio Ruiz. That's who you want to have on your list over Grayson Rodriguez. The guy that matched Rio Ruiz. The start to the season to for uh, Santander. It was, it all was, of them. He would be in the top five. Tubular is brought to you by Atman's Deli Harbor Point. Atman'sDeli.com is the website to find out more about their daily specials. Love everything about Atman's Deli. So happy they've got a new location open in Harbor Point with everything you love about Atman's plus a full bar. Get Check out the new Atman's Deli in Harbor Point. Here's what's coming up totally tubular-wise this evening. As we mentioned, the Orioles open up a series with the Royals. Dean Kramer taking on Michael Waka on Masson 2 tonight because I guess it's Nationals opening day, so they get yeah. Masson they today. No. I feel like it's a mid-afternoon game for them, like the Orioles so do. with like, like 4 like 5 4 5 yeah. <laughs> so probably at some point tonight, the Orioles game will be on both Masson and Masson 2, but it starts on Masson 2. Uh, uh, lead 8 tonight on ESPN, LSU Iowa, 7 o'clock, UConn USC at 9. Everything else, Glenn Clark Radio. Suns Pelicans at 8 on NBA TV. God, I got way too much. I can't, nope, no trivia tonight. Sorry, I'm out. Everything else, glennclarkradio.com. Uh, Non-sports. And on top of that is the uh, iHeartRadio Music Awards. Oh, son of a bitch. Hosted by Ludacris on Fox. Sit. Sit. It's also the American Idol time slot can't. premiere at 8 o'clock on ABC. It's huge. It's huge. I don't know why they're loading this Monday night. Uh, Hillary Clinton's going to be on Fallon later. Oh, I never miss when Hillary Clinton. What's she plugging? Is she, I don't know. Is she plugging Parrish? Um, I, would like, I think so. Like to think she season six. Of, I would really uh, like it if one time, like they they booked somebody like that, and she was like, I "Guess I'm just really excited about the um, Sense and Sensibility too, or whatever." Uh, all American season up. six on CW. Yeah, I haven't watched. I haven't watched. Everything. I hear you're missing out. P- people do like that yeah. show, but I have never watched. Vanderpump Villa. This is a new show oh, on no. Hulu. That's gonna be a no for me, dog. It is the uh, decadence and debauchery collide. In Vanderpump Villa, in a new un- this one's this one's unscripted. Oh sure, this yeah. one's unscripted. Sure. sure, in a docudrama following Mr. Vanderpump. You got it. And then on Peacock, uh, Ben, uh, sorry, Bray Wyatt becoming a mortal documentary. Yeah, that documentary. They're not putting him in the. All right, uh, it's a. Un- okay. What little go. documentary? <laughs> nope. Thanks everybody, press box. Oliver. Gr- oh, I need to thank the guests. Thanks today to Jeremy. Thanks to Rex Hudler. Thanks to Eric. Thanks to Bordy. We'll get it all up in the greatest hits section of the. Oh my God, it's so good. Tab at GlennClarkRadio.com. Tomorrow, Chelsea James from the Washington yes. Post. We'll talk some baseball with her. Uh, regular Tuesday stuff and uh, stuff and things. Thanks, everybody at Pressbox. All of our great sponsors and partners, Roos Chris, Live Casino and Hotel, Atman's Deli, A.J. Michaels, Guilford Hall Brewery, Royal Farms, Costa Sin, Glory Days Grill, your local Toyota dealer, buyatoyota.com. Thanks to Griffin, at Griffin underscore Bass. Follow us, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok, at Glenn Clark Radio. Have a great Monday evening. Go Birds. Go Angel Reese. Duke sucks.